African ancestors who began the march of humankind in the womb of Mother Africa. We ask these ancestors to be with us, to strengthen us, and give us a vision for the future. In the name of the African ancestors who began the march of humankind in the womb of Mother Africa and marched down the Nile, laying the foundations for human civilization and culture, we ask these Africans to be with us, to strengthen us, and give us a vision for the future. In the name of these African ancestors who built their pyramids and their temples to their God concepts, to their principles, and to their moral values, who left us a legacy of architectural and monumental building unparalleled in the history of the world, we ask these ancestors who built the pyramids, who built the temples, to be with us, to strengthen us, and give us a vision for the future. We ask these African ancestors who took this African culture and extended it throughout Africa, building the stone cities of Zimbabwe, building the empires of the Sudan, Ghana, Mali, and Sangai, building the Swahili city-states along the east coast of Africa, and in Christian Africa, asking King Lalibela and giving him the courage to build the 12 churches of Lalibela from the ground down, monuments to the world. We ask these Africans who spread this culture to the Dogo and to the Akan and to the Yoruba and to the Bankongo and to the Zulu. We ask these Africans to be with us, to strengthen us and give us a vision for the future. In the name of the Africans who opened up Africa, opened up the Nile Valley to other cultures and other peoples and they came in and nurtured themselves on the African greatness. First coming in early with the ancient Hebrews and they synthesized this culture and produced Judaism. Later coming in with the Christians and they synthesized this culture and produced Christianity. Coming in were also the Greeks who took the African culture, synthesized it and produced Greek civilization. And then later the Prophet Muhammad and with the Arabs coming into the Nile Valley, they synthesized the culture and produced Islam. We ask these African ancestors who as part of their legacy laid the foundations for Judaism, Christianity, Islam and Greek civilization to be with us, to strengthen us and give us a vision for the future. We ask those African ancestors pulled out of Africa, taken to the hells of North America, South America, the Caribbean, maintaining the spirit of African humanity in their hearts and in their minds, and who left us this enormous legacy of struggle. We ask those Africans who resisted enslavement in the villages of Africa, who resisted enslavement in the shores of Africa, who resisted enslavement in those forts and dungeons, who resisted enslavement in the holes of those ships, who resisted enslavement when they arrived on these shores in the New World. We ask these Africans who ran into the highlands of Northeast Brazil and established for 100 years the first free republic in the Americas, the Republic of Palmares, and their last great leader, Zumbi, whose spirit and sacrifice we ask these Africans who replicated the Brazilian experience and went into the highlands of Jamaica and became the maroon free communities. We ask these Africans who went into the backwoods of the Guyanas and Suriname and created free republic of the Suramaka and the Ajuka. We ask these Africans who went into the backwoods of Georgia and the swamps of Florida and moved with the Seminole Indians and resisted oppression. We ask these Africans who left us a legacy of struggle and resistance, the likes of which no one in the world has to be with us, to strengthen us, and give us a vision for the future. We ask these Africans who created and laid for us a foundation of struggle and resistance that was passed on generation after generation, that was passed on to Harriet Tubman who fell away out of enslavement and became a symbol of freedom for all of us. Similarly, Frederick Douglass and hundreds of thousands of others fought their way out of enslavement. We ask those Africans who went with Bookman Gasoline to create the greatest revolutionary experience in the history of the world, the Haitian Revolution, leaving us a legacy, the likes of which no one else has had. We ask these Africans to be with us, to strengthen us, and give us a vision for the future. The essence of power is the ability to define someone's reality and have them live according to that definition as though it is a definition of their own choosing. definition as though it is a definition of their own choosing. The 
essence of power is the ability to define someone's reality and have them live according to that definition as though it is a definition of their own choosing. Very, very pleasant morning to you. Thank you very much, Shane Clark. What good? Tell him how one howdy. My name is Kabul, Kabul Ma'at Keru. My broadcast assistant this morning is Joy Morgan. We're going through until 10 o'clock. That's when the big A comes in with the Sunday sunshine. It is Sunday, June 29. You're inside of the Africa Forum, running African. Our vision, the vision statement of this program, the Africa Forum, is to reunite the African family for development. Reuniting the African family for development. Our mission, crafting an African-centered agenda for change and development, being part of a change we want to see, bearing witness, demanding change, blazing Blazing new paths towards Africa's rendezvous with destiny. As Mualimu Marcus Messiah Garvey says, always trying to look beyond the present by calling upon our past experiences when we're looking at the future. A prescription from the Honorable Mualimu Marcus Messiah Garvey. Always try to look beyond the present by calling upon your past experience when you're looking at the future. Good morning, good morning. Uncle Jasaneb, Uncle Jasaneb. Life, prosperity, health. Indaminadaru, Indaminadaru. It's Amharic, it means good morning. Tanayastalim. Greetings to you. You're inside of the Africa Forum. Ujambo Wate. Ujambo Wate. How are you? You're inside of the Africa Forum. It is Running African. Reuniting the African family for development. We welcome you on the internet at iriafm.net. Welcome you on the 107s, 107.1 all the way to 107.9. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Let me welcome you if you're joining us on your iPhones or your Blackberry apps, your Androids. Good morning. Welcome to the program, Ank Uja Senev. Live prosperity and health to you. It is 11 minutes after 6 o'clock. We've got a lot to do this morning. We've got a lot to say. We've got a lot to get through. And we're going to be doing that the only way we know how to, which is through professionalism, decency, dignity, and decorum. But understanding that the passion and the fire burns deep. And so that while we're decent and dignified, our focus, as usual, is on the full and total liberation of African people, of the African continent, of the African diaspora. So full free, total freedom, challenging the status quo as we go along. It is what we do, it is how we know how to. Because we know, we know what power does. We understand what power is. And we understand that if they continue to define our reality for us as if we chose that reality, as if we chose that definition of our own reality, then we know that we are a conquered people. We'll talk about that within the context of the IMF. But we know that, that what, that's what power does. 
So Christ, Christ, C H R I S T, Christine, Christine, Lord God, which is Lagard. So Christ, Lord God, was in Jamaica recently. Well, she just left actually from the IMF, and Jamaicans were fawning over her in a way that we've never seen anybody fawn over anybody else. But we know that this is how we treat with the white people. This is how we view when they come to us in their white colors, in their white skins and with their white minds. This is how we treat with them and with what they're saying to us. This is how we respond. Did you see their faces on TV? These Jamaicans who have sold us out. Did you see them fawning over themselves to go shake her hand? Did you see them sitting with their mouths, their jaws dropped open, just taking in every word she was saying, just watching her and, uh, and sucking up and soaking up her definition of our own reality? Did you hear her trying to define your reality? And did you feel any anger? Or did you smile? And fawn like those who sat to listen to her. Now the IMF is no longer going to define our reality for us. And we should not allow that. The IMF is guilty of economic terrorism. We charge them with such. Our government is guilty of economic terrorism. We charge them with such. We have charged you, tried you, and found you guilty. Both the IMF and the government of Jamaica of economic terrorism. And what is economic terrorism? You see, Kawana says, it's a placing of human beings in a situation in which they are without hope, space, adequate defense, means of escape and survival, or means of overcoming actual or threatening danger, menace, or oppressive force is the very definition of terror, which has not only a physical, but also a mental element. The poor continue to suffer from the terrorism of a structural adjustment policies of the Bretton Woods institutions, including the International Monetary Fund. The essence of power is the ability to define someone's reality and have them live according to that definition as though it is a definition of their own choosing. We'll come back to that, but we've got an interesting program lined up for you this morning. Black people in Jamaica, it's about time you look at your state. It's about time you look at yourself. It's about time we look at where we are and call it what it is. Until we have defined our own reality, then there is no solving our problems. And we cannot allow others to continue to define our reality. So as we continue to reunite the African family for development... We're focused on 100 years of Garveyism, 100 years. July 20, 2014 marks 100 years of Garveyism, 100 years of the UNIA ACL. In this 100th year of the UNIA, we have been asking some questions through critical thinking and critical analysis, looking at where we are as a people, but also looking at Moalimu Marcus Messiah Garvey and asking some critical questions about whether or not we have moved questions, about whether or not we have moved and the extent to which we have moved toward full freedom, toward full liberation, as Moalimu Marcus Messiah Garvey would have had us. So that this morning we're going to be talking about uh, emancipation. We're going to be talking about 100 years of Moalimu Marcus Musahabi Garvey. We're going to be focusing on some of the upcoming events for the 100th year. Uh, we've been asking the questions and uh, there have been responses in terms of the plans. It is now... Um, just a, a few days before July, July 20, 2014 marks the exact date, 100 years since the UNIA ACL was formed by Moalamu Marcus Messiah Garvey and the men and women who were with him. Now, this morning, 
we're going to be looking at that. Uh, but the, 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 the critical issue that we want to pay some attention to as we go forward in terms of looking at Mualimu Marcus Messiah Garvey is to look at our own conditions, our own reality, and to look at this within the context of the teachings and the philosophies of Mualimu. All right, so that's coming up later on in July. This morning, we continue our lecture series. And, you know, every once in a while, we do that in the Africa Forum, where we provide a lecture series. And this morning, uh, we are going to be returning to what, uh, one of our lectures. And when I say returning to, it's going to be a new, brand new lecture. In the house with me this morning is educator, broadcaster, and author, Tekla Mekfet. His areas of research and writing include politics of culture and language, cricket and cultural symbolisms in sports, African philosophy in music, music and sports as instruments of education. And his coming new book later this year will be of his, uh, of his uh, University of the West Indies Bob Marley Lecture 2010 titled Could You Be Loved? Rastafari Reggae, Bob Marley, Africa Scattered for Rhythm of Spirit, of Oneness for the World. A book described by Dr. Noel Erskine, Professor of Theology and Ethics at Emory University in Atlanta, as insightful, incisive and instructive, a beautiful poetic move, brilliant author, poet, philosopher, Tekla Megfet relates. Bob Marley's Poetics to African Philosophy, the Bible and the Problems of Babylon as we encounter them in Jamaica and the world. Helps to resolve a tension between the individual and the community in Rasta Poetics, historical memory, clues to liberation in the present, out of history and prophecy. Philosophy in Rastafari offers unaccustomed, wide, practical application. We're looking forward to the book this morning. Tekla McFed will be joining me in the studios. Tekla himself, the author of uh, uh, quite a few books, and we'll get the names of those books for you in a little while. As a matter of fact, we have spoken to Tekla over the years about... Uh, uh, his books. All right, so we don't have that here, but the title of, of Tex Tekla's books, Boy in a Landscape, I know is one, and I know there are others. All right, so as soon as we get those, we remind you of the books um, already written by Tekla Medford. But he joins me this morning uh, as our lecturer in residence, and uh, he's going to be talking this morning is the title of his lecture. All right, so we'll tell you the title of Tekla Mekfet's lecture in just a moment. All right, but he's going to be joining me in the studio this morning. And, uh, of course, as I said, returning to our annual, uh, not annual, but our usual, from time to time, lecture in studio. So in a moment, we give you the title of Tekla Mekfet's lecture. Also joining me on the program this morning... We're going to be talking to the Principal Director of Culture in the Ministry of Youth and Culture, Delia Harris. She joins me on the program to talk about the plans for emancipation celebrations. We have been asking some serious questions about Jamaica's plans for emancipation. That came against the background of a statement made by Senator Norman Grant in which he said the only national event for Emancipation Day would be the Denby Agricultural Show. I have not I have not heard anybody refuting that. I have not heard anyone saying that that is not so. So we'll see what uh, the Principal Director of Culture in the Ministry of Youth and Culture says this morning about emancipation celebrations. We think that until we have received economic independence, our celebrations of independence must be toned down. It seems to me as if we have some questions to answer to in terms of uh, the direction in which we're going as a country. All right, so the Principal Director of Culture in the Ministry of Youth and Culture, Delia Harris, joins me on the phone lines this morning. Also joining me on the phone lines this morning... Liberty Hall will be holding its annual event, its annual lecture series, uh, celebrating and observing the birth date of Mualimu Marcus Messiah Garvey. This year, the lecture series are uh, being 
organized by Liberty Hall is in celebration of the 100th year of Garveyism, the 100th year of the UNIA. Donna McFarlane, director and curator of Liberty Hall, joins me on the phone lines this morning to talk about that. Also this morning, as we look at what's coming up for the 100th year of the UNIA, the 100th year of Garveyism, Valerie Dixon, Lady President of the UNIA ACL in Jamaica, will be joining me on the phone lines to talk about the plans that uh, are in place for the celebration uh, of, the UN of the 100th year of Garveyism. So we've got a lot to get through. Also this morning, Kanaka, you know, football is in the air. Kanaka Brasilia with Roger Hasfall, sports presenter here at IRFM. He joins me uh, in studio this morning to talk about the teams, uh, the African teams, how they're doing, teams in the competition, out of the competition, and the teams that remain, and also to look at the World Cup generally. All right, so we we're telling you that the annual lecture is on. <laughs> I keep saying annual because it, it is what it is. But what our lecture series this morning returns with Tekla Mekfet, and the topic he's going to be speaking on this morning uh, as part of the lecture is of Jamaica taking Rastafari seriously. Significance, Controversy, Coral Gardens, 1963, and Leonard Howell's Pinnacle Concept, complementing Marcus Garvey's Holistic Ideas of Education, Communal Cultural Consciousness for Independently Stimulating Shared Progress with Peace. So that it's a mouthful, but uh, once we get into the lecture, you'll begin to understand just where Tekla McFed is going with this. So once again... The theme for the lecture this morning of uh, of Jamaica taking Rastafari seriously. Significance controversy, uh, Coral Gardens, 1963, and Leonard Howell's Pinnacle Concept, complementing Marcus Garvey's holistic ideas of education, communal cultural consciousness for independently stimulating shared progress with peace. Looking forward to hearing Tekla McFitch on that this morning. So lots and lots are coming out of the program. Once again, Uncle John live prosperity peace the essence of power is the ability to define someone's reality and have them live according to that definition as though it is a definition of their own choosing of power is the ability to define someone's reality and have them live according to that definition as though it is a definition of their own choosing. 26 minutes now after 6 o'clock. The essence of power is the ability to define someone's reality and have them live according to that definition as though it is a definition of their own choosing. All right, that's our brother Ronuko Rashidi talking about the essence of power. And I'm playing this jingle all morning, this uh, blurb from Ronuko Rashidi, because I'm reminded of it uh, this entire weekend as Christ Lardgard, who is Christine Lagarde, uh, came into Jamaica uh, on the weekend and began to define our own reality for us. And I, 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 I watched this and I watched our own responses to this and all I can think about is the, es the, 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 the es what the essence of power is and the extent to which as a people, as African people, as black people, we have bought into our situation as slaves as serfs and so on we'll get back to that but this morning you know i the next piece i'm going to be playing uh is one written by me and i wrote this many years ago not so many but 2008 nine probably uh after we had gone to uh part of our in search of series and we had gone to uh, Westmoreland in search of uh, FIBA and uh, on the morning and you know normally we, uh, as part of the In Search of series for those persons who uh, were not part of this uh, it's public education through community development literary archaeology searching for those uh, 
of our African ancestors who we um, do not know enough about, who we have not honored enough, um, to find ourselves in, in, in part of our Sankofa ing. Go back and fetch it is what we did. So, and the part of that included, you know, going into the community for a few days, and we were in Westmoreland for a few days, almost a week actually, and then on the Sunday morning like this, broadcasting live from the town square or the town center. And uh, so we were broadcasting live uh, from Westmoreland on this particular morning, and our sister Tendai called for the women, for the men, to form a circle and for the women to be part of that circle. And we who were there, and it was a massive crowd in the square, we who were there felt and knew that the ancestors were there, that we had uh, in that uh, circle the spirit represented in all of us because we are our ancestors. So that when Sister P danced, when Vereen danced, we knew that this uh, was an embodiment of who we were, who we are, and who we will be. And uh, went and died through the libation, poor the libation, and it hit the ground and so on. And so I left from there with that in my mind. And I actually started writing uh, this piece uh, on the spot in my mind. So I got home and I completed the writing of this uh, that you're going to be hearing next. And um, it's called The Healing Circle. And I, called, and I could hear while I was writing it, uh, I could hear my sister Cherry Natural in my head, literally um, the lines as they came and the verses and, and so on as they came. I heard the voice of Cherry Natural in my head. So I called her and I said, Cherry, I'm writing this poem and I, I'm hearing you in my head. And so she came down and we met a few times and this is the result of what we did. The Healing Circle. A thousand women wept in Westmoreland. A thousand women wept in Westmoreland. They came. Ancestors came. Remembering as the rum turned ash concrete brown. They came. Sally. Oh. Sally. Still running African. Child eyes, Cuba, wired in the stink of Frankish Dallas portion. Little girls in navy blue tunics, white blouses, off which the sun bounces like fire. Bring forth remembrance, ancestors recalled to cleanse in the healing circle. To cleanse in the healing circle. A thousand women wept in Westmoreland. A thousand women wept in Westmoreland. Holding their bellies, bursting, bawling, silently recalling. Myrtilla, little Mimba, ancestors raped, recalled. To cleanse in the healing circle. To cleanse in the healing circle. When he did what he did, he knew women would die. When he did what he did, he knew women would die. But he didn't know we would return to cry, to ball, to cleanse in the healing circle. When Pat Clark screamed, the earth shook. Fibber. Trembled in the belly of Tendai. Sheba, Gloria, priestesses, dance in agony, rhythmic, angry. Down Babylon, down, down Babylon, down. Rastafarian sisters, Yoruba priestesses, Christian sisters, dancing in agony, rhythmic. And angry down Babylon town, down Babylon down. A thousand women came to Westmoreland. A thousand women came to Westmoreland. And Queen Nanny came from Moore Town. She came to protect all who 
Kaba, from Colonel Kocho, a Cheng Pong, and Captain Fure. Queen Nani came, from Nani Town she came, to burn the treaty, to cleanse, to mourn, to heal, rhythmic, angry. Town, Babylon, town. Town, Babylon, town. Shima dance, dance as the rum flows on the hot concrete, brown, dark brown on the pavement in memorial, dance, dance, ancestors came from paradise pen, they came, Lambs River. McCall's Prospect and Clifton. Ancestors came to Darleston to watch, to mourn, to weep, to cleanse in the healing circle. Ancestors wept, holding back the tears, weeping silently for Amelia, Matty, Phoebe, Old Fiba, Myrtilla, and Rosanna made the object of his brutal lust. A thousand women wept in Westmoreland, silently, painfully, marking the spot where the rum fell violently from Jamuki's trembling grip. Ancestors came, and the brothers mourned, clenched their fist and mourned, to protect themselves from brutal memories. Clench their fists, link their arms with Bogle and Taki, Sam Sharp and Garvey. Clench their fists to protect a thousand women in Westmoreland who came to cleanse, to heal, to rebirth. Mountain Lucy and Kuba enters the circle, joining in the dance, hugging Sister P, washing in her tears, cleansing in her spirit, dancing with her soul to soul, soul to soul. When he did what he did, he knew women would die. When he did what he did, he knew women would die. But he didn't know we would return to recall, to reclaim, to rebirth, to rekindle the fire. Fire. A thousand women came to Darleston. From Breadnut Island, Penn, they came. From Egypt and Kirkpatrick, they came. From Pesotan they came, Jenny Young came, Blind Mary came, Abba came, Bess came, Nancy came, Grandma Hilda came, Mama came, Ya Asantua came. A thousand women came to Darleston to wash, to weep, to heal, to rebirth, to dance in the square when very dark. To shepherd, to heal, to cleanse, and Fiba came, Fiba came to dance in the square, in the healing circle. Dance, Fiba, dance, dance as the drums roll. Mind at ease, soul rejoin, ancestors rebirth. Rest now. Rest now, gently. Rest now, softly. Fibber, rest now. Rest now. Ancestors came in the healing circle. And we made a promise, not just in Darleston, but we renewed the promise in Darleston to those upon whose shoulders we stand that we would be responsible for and understood our responsibilities as far as the full liberation of African peoples wherever we are is concerned. We made that promise. So when we recalled and remembered 
the ancestors who we saw in our minds returning to Darleston to be part of, a, of that healing circle. We renewed that promise that no one would define for us ever again our reality, that no one would ever again enslave us in whatever form, whether it's economic slavery or any other kind of slavery. We renewed that promise, the promise of emancipation, the promise of liberation, the promise of full free. The essence of power is the ability to define someone's reality and have them live according to that definition as though it is a definition of their own choosing. For centuries I've been trapped on the slave ship. We are Africans not because we were born in Africa. We are Africans because Africa was born in us. And we, receive, we refuse to give that up. Ancestors, please let your people see. Sound of Dell Jones with one called Slave Ship. The extent to which we're living in slavery, the extent to which we're still enslaved, the extent to which we are abiding economic terrorism was brought to, to stark reality and uh, uh, taken out of a closet as it were with a visit of uh, uh, Christ Lord God, uh, Christine Lagarde, to Jamaica uh, on the weekend. And to listen to her defining our reality to us. And not just to listen, but to watch, to bear witness to those among us who are in leadership positions, who would buy into this hogwash, who would buy into this stupidness, who would then have us believe and act as if we were indeed passing tests. Usually, when you pass a test, you graduate, don't you, to higher heights, from basic kindergarten to uh, prep to primary to high school to tertiary. We have been taking IMF tests forever. What have we really advanced or progressed to? We have uh, to look again at our situation. Now, 648, Sheikh Antajip says about culture, and I quote, I consider culture as a rampart which protects a people, a collectivity. Culture must above all play a protective role. It must ensure the cohesion of the group of collective belonging. This can be done by developing the linguistic factors, by re-establishing the historical consciousness of African and black people so as to arrive at a common feeling of belonging to the same culture and historical past. Once this is attained, it will become difficult to divide and rule and to oppose African communities one, one against the other. This is critical to our situation here in Jamaica. That if culture is not used uh, as a cohesion uh, of the group, is not seen uh, uh, or is not ensuring the cohesion of the group, of collective belonging, whether we're going to do it by the language, the linguistic factors, how we're going to be reestablishing the historical consciousness of Africa and black people, how we're going to preside or not, over a process that will see African people in Jamaica seeing themselves or having a common feeling of belonging to the same culture, to the same historical past. That as long as we have not done this, as long as we are not part of this process, then the divide and rule policy of all governments since so-called independence will continue. And African communities will see themselves opposed one against the other on many different fronts, including 
the tribal front of JLP and PNP. Now 6.52, you're inside of the Africa Forum. It's Running African. The essence of power is the ability to define someone's reality and have them live according to that definition as though it is a definition of their own choosing. We refuse to be what you wanted us to be. The IMF head, Christine Christ, was in Jamaica just recently, just this weekend. She told Jamaicans that the, the decision to devalue the currency is the correct one and um, that the IMF is seeing promising signs that the policy of devaluation and oppression is generating results. Christ Lagarde visited Jamaica for two days and said at a luncheon that domestic production is beginning to replace imports for some agricultural goods. Production, she said, is going up and foreign direct investment is increasing. Of course, defining for us our own reality as if it is a definition of our own choosing. This is a powerful woman. She says the competitive, competitiveness of Jamaica is on its way back. Defining for us our reality as if it is <laughs> a definition of our own choosing. The IMF assessment by Christ Lagarde, if we accept this, or if we are satisfied with this, this is, it takes us back to what Malcolm X says. And this is a quote from Malcolm X. He says, they put your mind right in a bag and take it wherever they want. A race of people is like an individual man until it uses its own talent, takes pride in its own history, expresses its own culture, affirms its own selfhood. It can never fulfill itself. Malcolm X. The essence of power is the ability to define someone's reality and have them live according to that definition as though it is a definition of their own choosing. We've got a job to do. Because what Christ Lagarde did when she came into Jamaica was really to stamp, to put the stamp of approval on the economic terrorism that Jamaicans are undergoing. And because she said it from her mouth, because this is what you called, uh, th there's, there's a term for this, you know, um, credibility coming from authority. There's a term for this. There's a term for this. She's credible because she represents the dominant power of a day. She's credible because she represents the Eurocentric ideology. She's credible because she stands as the head of one of the institutions of economic terrorism. An institution that has a world under its boots. So she's credible because she is the managing director of the IMF. The prestige of authority. The prestige of authority. This is what this is. We understand and know economic terrorism. And the fact that you have come in, Miss Christine Lagarde, doesn't change anything. We are redefining we are redefining and we are part of our mission is to craft and to develop new agendas for change. The IMF is not an agenda that is suitable for African people anywhere we are, wherever we are. Shall we say what again? What is economic terrorism? E 
economic terrorism as defined by our brother UC Kiwana is a placing of human beings in a situation in which they are without hope, space, adequate defense, means of escape and survival, or means of overcoming actual or threatening danger. Menace or oppressive force is the very definition of terror, which has not only a physical, but also a mental element. Speaking to the Bank of Jamaica's governor, she says, Governor, when you're at the mercy of having to get rid of your reserves in order to, to defend currency, I'm sure it must have occurred to you that Jamaica was bleeding and that it was not good for the country to actually spend so much of its reserves to defend a currency which was clearly not valued at the right level. Of course, Brian Winter must have really shaken his boot because Christ was speaking to him directly. The Jamaican dollar has fallen from 93.33 to 1 U.S. for May 1, 2013 to 112 and 3 dollars to 1 U.S. at the end of trading on a Thursday. And here is Christ defining for us our own reality. The essence of power is the ability to define someone's reality and have them live according to that definition as though it is a definition of their own choosing. The essence of power is the ability to define someone's reality and have them live according to that definition as though it is a definition of their own choosing. We're talking about our freedom. Yeah. We're talking about our freedom. And we know we've been trotting on this wine press for far too long. And that is why we are serious about how we allow the state or not to treat with independence and emancipation. So we say hold independence until we're fully emancipated. We say hold independence celebrations until we have achieved full free. Gonna go to a break when we come back. We speak with the principal director of culture and the ministry of youth and culture. Two minutes now after seven o'clock, you're inside of the Africa Forum. It is running African. Can we go into the phone lines to speak with the Principal Director of Culture in the Ministry of Youth and Culture, Delia Harris. We're looking at the government's plan for emancipation celebrations. We've been talking about this against the background and within the context of um, comments made by Senator Norman Grant. He uh, said publicly, and we've carried that here, that the only national celebration for um, the emancipation period will be the Denby Agricultural Show. We've been asking, so then, what about the vigil at Seville? What about other Emancipation Day celebrations? Isn't the nation uh, uh, or, or isn't the state also responsible for, as usual, because they've been doing this since 1998, for uh, overseeing the celebrations, especially the one at Seville. Well, we haven't received an answer as such, but uh, hopefully the Principal Director of Culture in the Ministry of Youth and Culture will be able to talk to us about that as we go to the phone lines to Delia Harris. Delia, good morning. Thank you for joining us on the Africa Forum. Good morning, um, and thank you for having me because it's important to clarify what you just said to the nation. Which is that? That the only emancipation celebration will be at Denby. Yes, I'm glad you're giving me the opportunity to do so. Right, because I was actually quoting Senator Norman Grant. We have a clip here. He made that statement publicly. It has been carried in almost all the newscasts across the nation. And right. So, so go ahead and clarify first uh, that, Delia. Thanks. Well, first of all, I'm surprised um, that he would say that because there is no 
national agreement that that would be so from the level of cabinet um, and through parliament the celebrations for emancipation and the commemoration of emancipation and independence is something that had been agreed and had been passed. Mm -hmm. We also had the launch of Jamaica Festival, um, which the media was invited, and I have the Guide to Jamaica Festival in my hand, and it's very clear about how emancipation will be commemorated. Right. I so. also got a copy of the Guide to Jamaica Festival, and I got that on Friday. Uh, right. it, yes, uh, uh, the, the, it, it says that there will be an emancipation vigil at Seville and mm -hmm. maybe you can help us with this because we've been calling the Jamaica National Heritage Trust, this is the, the agency we normally call for information the on the emancipation agency. vigil and we've uh, been asking for persons to come on to talk about the emancipation vigil. Usually, mm -hmm. And we're going off of what normally happens, Delia, which is that usually um, by now would have had, uh, you know, three or four interviews leading up to the emancipation vigil. At the moment, though, no one can tell us if it is actually on, if it is really on and what format it will take. All right. Well, I'm not sure why um, the JNHD would not have been able to speak to that. Mm -hmm. But the vigil is on, the emancipation jubilee, as we like to call it. Um, and, and there has been no change to the format. Um, it will remain the same. In fact, this year we have written to, we've added some activities because we've written to the churches across Jamaica and we've asked them that this year for emancipation, um, they all gather for a watch night service and that there is worship from July 31 heading into the morning of August 1st where we ask for prayers and thanksgiving for the act of emancipation. Mm -hmm. So does it, which, does it represent a scaling down of sorts in the uh, emancipation vigil itself, considering that you're asking persons to meet at churches, whereas you used to say, let's meet at Seville? No, no, it's not a scaling down at all. Um, what we're trying to do, Andrea, <coughs> is actually expand the national activities so that all Jamaicans can be a part. Mm -hmm. um, you'll appreciate that the Jubilee is at Seville, which is one location, not every Jamaican will be able to travel all the way there. Some yes. do, some can't. Mm -hmm. And so we thought that this year emancipation was important that every single person in their own way should be able to celebrate and to commemorate that. Mm -hmm. And so we thought get the churches involved. We said there would be Jubilee. We're teaming with Sligoville on their vigil as well. Um, and then on Emancipation Day, we are having a celebration of drums in town squares right across the island. So this year is in fact a year that we decided that we would we would expand mm -hmm. the engagement with emancipation. Well, so this, is, this is good to know because we were hearing quite different and then uh, uh, Senator Grant told us something quite different. So you are clearing that up. You're saying um, this is an erroneous statement by Senator Norman Grant that this is not the, uh, Denby is not the only national event. The national Absolutely event not. at Seville Will, will go on, and that yes. not only will it go on, but that there is an expansion of the emancipation celebrations in Jamaica this year? Absolutely, absolutely. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, in terms of the town squares and the celebration of drums, can you talk to us a little bit more about that, where that will be happening? Is it every town square, and how that, how that will be um, executed? In all the town squares, it's being executed through the JCDC. Um, one year we had drum fest, a number of years in Kingston at Emancipation Park. And again, it's about identifying, um, you know, the students, identifying the drum, the drum chords across the island. We sat down and we thought what, what would be a good way for us to not just celebrate emancipation, but to make that kind of African connection that needs to be made when it comes to emancipation. And we thought a celebration of drums would be ideal. And so the JCDC will be activating that across the island. So we're talking about um, from July 31, the vigils island-wide, the Emancipation Jubilee, Sligoville, and then in the day, Emancipation of Drums. Uh, Minister Hannah was very clear. Um, in former years, we've, uh, there's been a coined term, emancipendence. And this year she said separate them because she didn't want emancipendence to kind of water down the importance of both things, and mm -hmm. she felt that emancipation mm -hmm. on its own deserved 
that kind of recognition. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm not sure. We totally agree. Know. We are totally agreeing with that, and it's something that we've said in this space for many, many years since that term was coined. I think it was last three years or so that we yeah. began to hear about emancipation, which didn't mean anything um, um, at the end of the day uh, in mm -hmm. terms of even what you were celebrating. So, so, mm -hmm. so we're glad for that. All right. So that um, that will take us back to Seville then uh, on the day. I know that Joan Seegers, who used to be with the Jamaica National Heritage Trust for the last two years, um, was uh, given the responsibility of organizing this. I don't know if she's still the person um, or if, it's, if it has been done through the Jamaica National Heritage Trust. Can you give us some idea as it's to... It's been done through the Jamaica National Heritage Trust um, mm -hmm. with support service mm -hmm. from the JCDC. Okay. Um, you, you can imagine that in terms of finance, um, things are a little bit tough. Mm -hmm. But we are determined that this year it will happen. So we will still have um, you know, the, the performances that happen on the night. Um, the public will still be able to come, get them, them mugs with them, like a coffee and mm -hmm. them chocolate. Mm -hmm. It's it's an event that we could never, ever sit down and say it can't happen. And this year, um, I know the TEF has come on board to assist the JNHD to make sure that it happens as well. So I just want to reassure everybody, emancipation is too important. There, there could never ever have been a national decision that it could not be recognized. Um, and this year I think it's just the start of how we hope to expand the engagement year after year after year. So I just want to assure everybody that um, that, that could never have been even the approach from the ministry. Mm -hmm. So I just want everybody to just come out. Um, the Seventh-day Adventists were one of the first people to write us to say we are on board and we are happy that this is happening. Mm -hmm. And we will tell the churches to come out on the night. Mm -hmm. um, I met with Sister Minnie the other day and she said they asked them to light a candle mm -hmm. at midnight for the spirit of the ancestors. So we really, really feel it's important to do it. And mm -hmm. so I was really glad when you asked me to come and speak this morning because I, I would never want anybody to believe that emancipation would not have gotten the kind of treatment that it deserves. All right, well, that is good news, and, and we can relax and exhale a bit. Let us see wh where this is going. Uh, big celebration, as usual, at Seville, July 31. Uh, usually, you know, you're gathering there from, the, from dusk uh, mm -hmm. to, to, to dawn, and, and, this, and the, it's, it's really involved. So I suppose as time goes by, you'll give us a more idea as to Absolutely. what exactly will be happening. Before you go there, Dale, let's talk a little bit about Marcus Garvey and July, yeah. July 20, August 17. Uh, in the, I have the book. I, I don't see a reference to mm -hmm. celebrations for Moulamu Marcus Messiah Garvey. Uh, is this an oversight? Uh, uh, will there be, uh, the, is the government involved in any way, the ministry in any way, in celebrating 100 years of Garveyism? We absolutely are. Um, you recall, Andrew, well, I don't know if you, you would recall it, but this year the minister's presentation in our sectoral debate is rooted in Garvey. Mm -hmm. um, not without chance, where God says you, you can't satisfy the hope of a suffering people by chance. And so the entire ministry's operations for the year is rooted in Garvey. At the, at the front of the guide, not necessarily in the schedule, it says um, independence recognizes activities in our country's history which must be taken into consideration. And for this year, the 100th anniversary of the UNIA um, conceptualized by the right excellent Marcus Garvey is a part of that. Mm -hmm. So um, I guess in the schedule it doesn't specify, but for the entire Jamaica festival, mm -hmm. all the things that we do well, will, will be inclusive and driven by that. There is a entire segment of the Grand Gala that celebrates Garvey for signature conversations. Um, one of the conversations is about Garveyism and the national agenda. But, but it's, it's interesting, Delia, that, that um, the celebration of 100 years of Garveyism is, is incorporated into the Grand Gala, etc., which I think if Moala Marcus Messiah Garvey were alive, um, he would not be too happy with that. I am Why would you say that, Sandra? Why would you say that? Just read his philosophies. But, but, but before we go there, let me just uh, ask you about um, July 20. July 20 represented representing 100 years since the formation of the UNIA. This year, uh -huh. this year, the centennial of of of, 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 Gar of Garveyism, and 
I, I'm, I'm hearing you. It's, it's a very evasive answer that you've given me regarding this. Not at all. It's not evasive. All right. At so all. what I exactly? What exactly is being done by uh, I, or through the ministry uh, regarding the celebration of August 17 and or July 20? Well, I started off by saying first of all because I wanted to root it first of all the conversation and the fact that Gavi is not an add-on. Mm -hmm. That the decision is that that's one of the most important things that we have to recognize this year and that we have in fact even written to the schools, we've written to the Ministry of Education to say um, in collaboration with you for the rest of this year activities have to be enacted so school children are aware so I just want to make that clear. Mm. We have met with the UNIA because we feel that as an organization um, we can't overlook them mm. in the approaches to Gavi mm -hmm. and the things that we do so that we avoid Things like what you just said in terms of um, we are putting in a medallion and it's against the principles. We'll talk about that a little bit later on. But the UNIA has a full schedule that we are doing collaboration with them. Mm -hmm. um, I've said to them, let's hold a press conference and announce the activities together so that we don't have the ministry coming forward and saying, this is what's going to be happening, or the UNRA is saying this is what's going to be happening, but that we do it collaboratively mm -hmm. so that everybody can understand um, the magnitude of the things that we're going to do. All right, so I suppose we'll hear uh, after you, it's sometime this morning, I think when about 9.15 or so, and we'll be speaking with the later president of the UNRA, Valerie Dixon. So I suppose when she comes sure. on, she'll probably, she give us, probably be able to give us uh, some more information regarding that. Valerie, so can give you a full schedule. All right, so that you're saying that the ministry has partnered with the UNIA in the, yes. in the celebrations for July 20 and August 17. Well, not just those two days. The celebrations mm -hmm. continue over a period of time. Mm -hmm. There are a number of things that will be happening, um, and so I, I'll give Valerie the opportunity to come on and tell you what they are if she chooses to do so. But um, Garvey, uh, Andrew, I'm not sure. To us, those things are important. They are critical. Um, the signature conversations are dialogue that we think need to happen that post Jamaica independence. These are things that will continue to be discussed and shared in our schools, in our communities. Mm -hmm. And so we felt that Garveyism and the national agenda was also important that people would understand that Garvey's philosophies are things that are relevant throughout time. Mm -hmm. And so that some of the things and some of the ways that we approach challenges in Jamaica are issues that, that as a visionary, he saw these are things that he would have an approach challenges in Jamaica are issues that, that as a visionary, he saw these are things that he would have engaged with and these are things that we can still apply to our lives today as a people. So that, so, and, so that the signature yes. conversations you mentioned on Sunday, July 20, I'm, I'm noting from a schedule that there are signature conversations at the Institute of Jamaica Auditorium and these conversations yes. are relating to Mualimu, Marcus Messiah Garvey? One of the conversations is specific mm -hmm. to Garvey. Therefore, um, one of the conversations is about Stuart Hall one of the conversations looks at Bob Andy mm -hmm. because as a songwriter, singer, we think more recognition of his work needs to be done as well in Jamaica. And one of the conversations will engage with the Jamaican Maroons. Mm -hmm. You know, Delia, I, I, I hear you and, and I know but, but the Ministry of Culture over the years has been what it has been in terms of the celebration of emancipation and the celebration of Mualimu Marcus Messiah Garvey and we give him credit for that. But I think that something went wrong somewhere because I see July, Sunday, July 20, the national finals, the big stage, Randy Williams Entertainment Center. This is on the anniversary. It's, I mean, 100th year and then the signature conversations and I'm thinking that, uh, you know, something went wrong in terms of looking at the calendar for the year and factoring in the hundredth year of of Garveyism, uh, this is the only conclusion I can draw from what I'm saying. But what, what is the big stage, though? Why would it be contrary to Garvey's philosophy? Because if I'm not mistaken, um, Garvey was also someone who was very big on the arts. It doesn't say so in the schedule. And you see, this is the thing. That, you see, this is, a, this is a talent contest. The big stage is a talent contest. And there's nothing wrong with a talent contest. We, we, we endorse them. And, uh, you know, this is Iron FM. This is what we do. Um, right. But and I'm what that we've outside, done is we've yeah. gone into all the communities. And we are trying to give 
every single Jamaican the opportunity to express the creative talent that they have. We have been working to develop that talent, and we felt that on a national stage, we would give every single man on the street who is able to do so a chance to, to express themselves creatively. So I'm not sure. No, maybe I'm why that's if it was contrary. It, 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 it's yeah. not, I'm not saying it's contrary. I'm saying July 20 is the exact date. It's the anniversary yeah. of the formation uh, 100 years ago of the UNIA. And I'm saying that if consideration had gone into that, I mean, you work in the media, you've been in the media forever, and, and you know exactly what I'm saying, Delia. If consideration had gone into that, it would have said so. It would have said oh, so. So I think that there was an oversight in terms of a celebration. It wasn't an oversight, though. I, I, I can tell you it wasn't an oversight. I'm, I'm just, my thing is this. Mm -hmm. We we did this guide, um, and it's an abbreviated version of the things that we have to do. And, um, and you also work in the media. You know, if we send a booklet, nobody's going to read it. Um, but what we've done is we've sent the guide as a preliminary, and then we've been having discussions like this with the media and with the public about the things that, that are being done. We didn't feel that there should be a single celebration on the 20th. We're having the discussions in the morning. We're having the big stage in the evening. The UNIA is having their activity. So the entire day will be about um, recognizing Gavi in different ways the difference and is, in different forms. The difference is, Delia, is that if it were... Norman Manley or Bustamante, it would have said so. Yeah. It would have said so. All right. Uh, let's I, just I, 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 well, mm -hmm. I can't fight your opinion, but I'm not sure. But mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, yeah. August 17 on, on Garvey's birthday, you're saying that this is also in tandem with the, with the UNIA? UNIA. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. All right. Okay, so just to recap a little bit, and this is good news coming to us that the emancipation celebrations are not cancelled. They're not being scaled down. As a matter of fact, they've been expanded this year. And Seville, the vigil is still on at Seville on July 31. We're clear on that. We're very clear on that, Andrew. And, um, I mean, I'm, again, I want to thank you for the opportunity to clarify. Um, always, if there are questions that the public needs clarity, and we're always willing to come and speak with Running Africa, you know, um, We've had a long-term engagement with you through the ministry, and we hope that we can continue that. Thank you very much, Delia Harris. Thank you for and coming thanks on. Thanks for having me. All right. That was Delia Harris, Principal Director of Culture in the Ministry of Youth and Culture. We pay tribute and honor our ancestors. Those who were tried and sentenced for their role in the 1831-1832 Emancipation War in Jamaica, the parish of Westmoreland. I wish I knew how it would feel to be free. Say I'm loud, say I'm clear for the whole round world here. Garrick from Belfast in St. James. Sentenced to 259 lashes. David Gibson from Clifton. Sentenced to death. John Gilling. Owned by Mrs. Parncher. Sentenced to 36 lashes. Ishmael. Alias Billy Grant from Prospect. 100 lashes. James Green. Clifton. Sentenced to death. Frederick Gray from Rose Hill. Sentenced to 100 lashes. Sam Hilton. From Lambs River, sentenced to 100 lashes. Philip Irving from McHale's Prospect, sentenced to 100 lashes. William McIntosh from Belfont in St. James, sentenced to 250 lashes. Duncan McKenzie from Flower Hill, sentenced to be transported. William McKinley, owned by S. Whittingham, sentenced to death. Richard McLeod from McHale's Prospect, sentenced to death. James Miller, owned by Dr. Fuller, sentenced to 160 lashes. John Morris from Clifton, acquitted. Coffey, alias Richard Morrison, from Rock Pleasant, sentenced to be transported. Richard Shelton from Ducket Spring and Lambs River, sentenced to 200 lashes. Premier, alias Richard Skelton, from Co Park, sentenced to be transported. John M. L. Stevens from Sevenage, sentenced to 200 lashes. George Tharp, owned by enslaver George Tharp, sentenced to 150 lashes. Titus, alias George Waite from Richmond, sentenced to death. 
George Watson from Horton Grove, sentenced to be transported. Robert Whitehorn from Clantarf, sentenced to death. Edward Whittingham from Cow Park, sentenced to 200 lashes. Eliza Whittingham from Cow Park, sentenced to death. Jane Whittingham from Cow Park, sentenced to be hanged. S. Whittingham from Cow Park, sentenced to be transported. Robert Began from Lambs River, sentenced to be transported. Archie Wilson, owned by enslaver Archibald Wilson, sentenced to 150 lashes. John Wiley from Barnside, sentenced to be transported. Robert Morris, owned by Mary Spence, Stewie, sentenced to death. George Murray from Clifton, sentenced to death. Edward Partner, owned by Isabella Partner, sentenced to death. Philip, owned by William Shellett, sentenced to six months imprisonment. Seven trees. Barren, strange fruit. Black bodies swinging in the southern breeze. Henry Cooper. From Cow Park, sentenced to death. Henry Cowan from Argyle Pen, sentenced to death. Robert Davis from Sweet River, sentenced to be transported. Thomas Davis from Enfield, sentenced to be transported. Matty, alias Richard Drackett, owned by Mary Torrent, acquitted. John L. Laurie, owned by a white sailor, sentenced 14 days imprisonment. Hugh Ferguson from Clifton, sentenced to death. William Ferguson from Clifton, acquitted. Jack, alias John Fleming, owned by Daniel McGibbon, sentenced to 50 lashes. William Evans, alias Alexander Bentloss, from Welsh Pool Plantation, sentenced to death. William Brooks, Edward Bart, from Duckett Spring and Lambs River Plantation, sentenced to death. John Bull, owned by Edward J. Young, sentenced to death. John Campbell, from Floor Hill, Sentenced to 120 lashes. William Chambers, owned by Mary Gray, sentenced to death. David Clark, owned by a Mr. Young, sentenced to 120 lashes. Samuel Jarrett from Crow Park, sentenced to death. Amelia Johnson, acquitted. Nelson Carr from Belfast St. James, sentenced to 250 lashes. Edward Lambden from Barneyside, sentenced to death. Robert Lambert, Owned by William Shillette, Esquire, sentenced to 39 lashes. John Linton from Heritage, sentenced to death. Joe Little from Walchpool, sentenced to be hanged but mercifully escaped. James Reed from Hermitage, sentenced to death. Thomas Reed from Lambs River, sentenced to 150 lashes. James Ricketts, owned by Edward J. Young, sentenced to death. Thomas Rook, Mikhail's Prospect, sentenced to 100 lashes. Samuel Sampson, owned by Mary Torrent, sentenced to 14 days imprisonment. William Martin from Cow Park, sentenced to be transported. A.C. McHale from Mikhail's Prospect, sentenced to death. George McHale from Mikhail's Prospect, sentenced to 100 lashes. John McCallum from Mikhail's Prospect, sentenced to 60 lashes. Robert McGee from Cow Park, sentenced to 200 lashes. Alexander Magrotha, owned by Mary Torrent, sentenced to 200 lashes. James McIntosh, owned by Amelia McIntosh, sentenced to 250 lashes. Richard, alias Richard McIntosh, from Belfont in St. James, sentenced to 100 lashes. Robert Allen, owned by enslaver Isabella Partner, sentenced to four dozen lashes. Jack Anderson, from the Retrieve Plantation, sentenced to death. John Appleton, from the Ducket Spring and Lambs River Plantation, sentenced to 100 lashes. David Atkinson, from Darleston, sentenced to death. William Atkinson, Darleston, sentenced to death. Fred, alias William Ball, owned by enslaver Mary Malin, sentenced to death. Daniel Barrijam, from Chillons, sentenced to death. Billy, alias William Binham, from Golden Spring, sentenced to death. Blood on the leaves. And blood at the roots. We remember 
and honor those who walked and worked before us and thus paved the path down which we now walk. Now 7.30 and a lecture with Tekla Mekfet coming up right after this. All right, you're inside the Africa Forum, Running African, and I uh, told you earlier that our lecture series returns with Tekla Mikfet. This morning, his lecture is entitled of uh, Jamaica Taking Rastafari Seriously, Significance, Controversy, Coral Gardens, 1963, and Leonard Howell's Pinnacle Concept, Complementing Marcus Garvey's Holistic Ideas of Education, Communal Cultural Consciousness for Independently Stimulating Shared Progress with Peace. Tekla McFetch is an educator, broadcaster, and author. His areas of research and writing include politics of color and language, cricket and cultural sim uh, symbolisms in sports, African philosophy in music, music and sports as instruments of education. Tekla's coming new book later this year will be one of his University of the West Indies Bob Marley lecture, titled uh, 2010, titled Could You Be Loved? Rastafari, Reggae, Bob Marley. Africa scattered for rhythm of spirit, of oneness for the world. We turn over now to Tekla Mekvet with the Africa Forum lecture. Rastafari greetings. Redemption song I bring. I hail thy father, his imperial majesty, Haile Selassie, justified in the spirit of the one shared great ancestor manifest in the flesh, Jaliv. June 16 was Leonard First Rasta Howell's Earth Day, and despite efforts, Ari FM and Bonga Jerry straight up apart, little or nothing has been in the press and major media. As I listened to Andrea bemoaning the lack of seriousness in celebrating the centenary of Garvey's UNIA, I'm reminded that the Jamaica idea is really about playing down the Africa, the blackness in us, to accommodate minorities and the world. We'll get nowhere doing that. A little about how I came to be doing this program about truth and rights and justice for Rastafari, disrespected by the government of Jamaica, as typified in the issues of apology and compensation for what has become known as the Coral Gardens Massacre of 1963, and the need for the rehabilitation of the concept of Leonard Howell's Spinnacle Commune, plundered, destroyed in 1954, following pattern of state and public harassment of Rastafari. Living in foreign countries of whiteness, whenever I saw black people being mistreated by whites, my instinct would be to get involved in the cause of our sister and our brethren. I'm passing through Clapham on a double-decker bus and I see a group of white youths harassing a black girl and I get off the bus, sort out these white youths and see our little sister home. I'm working in an office in Jamaica and at a general staff meeting, I'm being obliged to listen to its CEO telling a co-worker that her daughter will become no better than she is, a mere messenger. I intervene, telling the CEO, the CEO that what he's doing is not right. Of Rastafari standing up for truth and rights, every day we pay the price, a living sacrifice, as Bob Marley reminded. When I didn't resign as requested, my contract was terminated. Of whiteness abroad and at home, playing around looking to deny rights, humiliating, being condescending to black people, as in the runaround being given to Rastafari in relation to the need for redemption, given the injustices by the government of Jamaica dealing with the issues of coral gardens and the rehabilitation of the Pinnacles commune concept. I've had to get off the bus and get involved. This program is of victory in sacrifice and of law becoming justice relating to Rastafari and national conscience needs for going forward as a community for production for progress with peace and of the recognition of self in the concepts of Marcus Garvey and Leonard Howell this program also paves the way for a discussion of a holistic concept multi-level 
International Polytechnic School, University, and Pan-African Research Center in St. Anne's Bay, befitting the Distinguished Discipline Eclectic Scholarship and Organizing Skills of Vision for Liberation coming of the little black man out of St. Anne's Bay, where... The present focal Christopher Columbus statue will be placed in the Catholic Church nearby of shared Spanish history. And Marcus Garvey will be placed in that focal position, looking out to the sea towards repatriation, reclaiming, reuniting Africa worldwide towards Mother Africa's liberating Pan-African world oneness. This program is very much about taking Rastafari, humankind's Mother Africa philosophy seriously, and not being patronized by states and peoples. So then, you know, Peter Tosh always is reminding us that just say no, why we must be the ones who are always suffering. I want us to look at this idea. Newly independent Jamaica's Coral Gardens, 1963, Easter Sacrifice of Rastafari, offering humankind's Mother Africa identity towards international morality for collective security and shared prosperity with peace, of prophecy and victory in sacrifice. Let us look at Edlina's report of the Coral Gardens affair. The Gleaner editorial of Saturday, April 13, 1963, stated, quote, On Thursday morning, a half dozen persons of Rastafari persuasion got themselves hopped up on ganja, and out of a misguided sense of grievance, a question of squatting on rows always involved, created a major incident in the air, that is a tourism north course, as a result of which eight persons were killed, a gas station burnt, and other private property damaged. But it was not an uprising, and it was not an insurrection. On the evidence, it was an isolated case of violence and murder by a gang of six men. That was the Gleaner Report editorial of the so-called Coral Gardens Affairs. Giving context to the incident, Investigative reporter John Maxwell of the Weekly Review newspaper Public Opinion 27463 takes reference from a Rastafari source about the same incident. Quote, Many months ago, Rudolf Franklin, one of the three Rastafari brethren who were shot dead on Thursday, April 11, occupied a plot of land on the Rosal estate. The headman of the property, Edward Fowler, who also died on Thursday, April 11, brought a policeman to eject the brother off the land. The unharmed brother was shot six times by the policeman and believed dead was, taken to hosp was, was not taken to hospital until hours after. The brother recovered after months of treatment, although he was told by the doctor he would live for only a short period. The fact is that his bloody mangled tripe intestines had been hanging out and he was immediately sentenced to six months' imprisonment on a charge of ganja. These, end of quote, these, the Rastafarians assert, are the events which led directly to the incidents of Holy Thursday. And we could say, and Good Friday, and beyond Coral Gardens, all around Jamaica. What and who is Rastafari? that a personally armed Prime Minister Alexander Bustamante could lead the army and police into Montego Bay of Coral Gardens and spread all around the island the vitriolic mantra, if the jail cannot hold the Rastafarians, put them on Bogue Hill, which is to say the cemetery. And the Jamaica Chamber of Commerce loudly chorused, quote, exterminate this evil movement, end of quote of which an eerie consensus of hatred had risen to the surface of national consciousness around and across the whole island activated by Bustamante's leadership. The Gleena editorial, 14 April 63, pointed at Rastafari all over, declared, quote, Never before in Jamaica 
a unification of the community as a whole in general resentment against those elements. As described in the editorial of 13463, quote, the lunatic fringes of communities, end of quote. And so, all around and across Jamaica's 14 parishes, citizens were being rallied to help the police and army capture and beat and kill or jail rastas. And so, for survival around and across Jamaica, it was as the Lena 19463 reported of St. Thomas in the East, where Rastafari first rose to public attention through the seminal prophet Leonard I Rasta Howell out of Trinityville. Despite the Nazareth vow of the Bible, as hopeful protection against the mania of state violence, the quote is from the Dlina, Rastafarians are now changing their appearance by shaving off their beards and locks of hair. End of quote. Why this visceral or gut reaction to Rastafari by the creature called typically the Jamaican? Could it be that Rasta was early associated with repatriation to Africa? And the Jamaican prefers to know self of Jamaica, originating bread of colonialism? Valuing self, others, and progress in degrees of whiteness? How was Rastafari announced in Jamaica to the world by Leonard Howell out of the expansive sugarcane areas of St. Thomas, an area white Jamaican Alexander Bustamante would have known through his money-lending profession, enhanced in a one of you, of you, natural tone and language of the black laboring masses while nurturing ambition to lead such ones as would formally come about with the granting of adult suffrage for the 1944 election which would make Alexander Bustamante leader of the Jamaica Labour Party, chief minister of colonial Jamaica. You're inside of the Africa Forum and we're presenting our lecture series. Uh, this morning, Tekla Mikvet is delivering the lecture of Jamaica taking Rastafari seriously. We return. Tekla Mikvet is live in the studio. We return to him. Coral Gardens and Pinnacle and Alexander Bustamante at the center of it. A pattern of harassing Leonard Howell of Pinnacle continuing into Coral Gardens. Let's see this sense of identity which this white Jamaican Alexander Bustamante had. He needed a sir. He arranged to get a sir in order to lead Jamaica into independence because his idea of leadership is colonial. What was it that this William Clark deed polled in the white Spanish name Bustamante and all Jamaica would have been hearing from a prophet of Rastafari named Leonard Howell, declaring of Haley Selassie, meaning power of Trinity, out of Trinityville and on the steps of colonial churches in the colonial parade area of downtown capital Kingston preaching. Following the crowning of Rastafari of Ethiopia, Mother Africa, in 1930, as King of Kings of the Lion of the Tribe of Judah, elect of Jah, His Imperial Majesty, Haile Selassie, I, Leonard Howell's acclamation showing that this was indeed the black king that Marcus Garvey had told to expect as a turning point for black peoples of the world and all humankind of primordial Mother Africa. You know, we often forget that all humankind is of Mother Africa and Rastafari is of leading the way, bringing the whole world together, bringing first of all the obvious Africans and the whole world together of Mother Africa. It's a time of coming awareness of African peoples influencing all humankind as of, in time, Naya Bingi Rastafari reggae music all over the world. As of Eilis Selassie's quote, quote, when African righteous people come together, the world will come together. This is our divine destiny. 
Leonard Howell formed an Ethiopian Salvation Society, even as His Majesty had established the Ethiopian World Federation. The whole world is Ethiopia. The whole world will come together to the fullness of this identity through Rastafari. Leonard Howell spoke of peoples gathered around the Garden of Eden, Ethiopia, as of the beginning, as of sense of self-salvation being renewed. Prophet Howell said, People of all races, classes and creeds should take note of this man. Go and check for yourself. See the Institute of Jamaica Clippings. Howell, acknowledging self as servant of the King of Kings, declared that this man, His Imperial Majesty Haile Selassie, is the true king for all black people of Jamaica, not the white king of England. This declaration attracted a sentence for sedition. Leonard Howell declared that this king of kings out of humankind's mother, Africa, this man, H-I-M, him, is the promised biblical manifestation of the true and living God. Why should Rastafari's veneration of the essential spirit of him, Haile Selassie, so upset Jamaica, manifest in the conquering selfish spirit of Alexander, the great Bustamante, who, cabinet minute shows, soon sought in 1963 post, post Carol Gardens to have his birthday become a national holiday. Yes, the newly ascended Sir Alexander Bustamante sought to make his personal birthday a national holiday. Why alarm about Rasta's veneration of his imperial majesty as a spirit of him? The him italicized in the Bible. I refer you to James Fraser's giant step of anthropology and acclaimed eye-opening book entering the 20th century, The Golden Bow. As it makes links between mythologies of the worlds, it identifies a universal feature giving context for beginning in a standing Rastafari's veneration of his imperial majesty. And here I quote from The Golden Bow. This combination of priestly function with royal authority is familiar to everyone, all cultures. Kings were revered in many cases not merely as priests, that is, as intercessors between man and God, but as themselves gods, able to bestow upon their subjects and worshippers those blessings which are commonly supposed to be beyond the reach of mortals and are sought, if at all, only by prayer and sacrifice offered to superhuman and invisible beings. The king is frequently a magician as well as a priest. It's the idea of a man-god, end of quote. And it's easy to make the reference to the idea of Jesus Christ. Eke homo, behold a man. Eke die, behold God. Jesus Christ. The symbolism is there in all cultures of the world. The idea of sacrifice. Jesus Christ is in fact the manifestation of the spirit and the possibilities thereof of the spirit of the creator in all humankind. Yes! Let me say that again. Jesus Christ, the manifestation of the spirit and the possibilities thereof of the spirit of the creator in all humankind. Why look to exterminate this evil movement as the Chamber of Commerce called Rastafari? This evil movement that identifies and acclaims African roots for itself and the world, which is of Mother Africa, creation of the beginning. Why in the 1930s, Bustamante wrote to the colonial office about, quote, that terrible thing they call Rastafari, end of quote, and letters to the editor of the Dlina describing Leonard Owell as a, quote, most dangerous man, end of quote, to Jamaica. Why, if the prisons can't hold them, the cemetery will? Colonial Office Files of 1940 spoke of Howell's movement, quote, combining sedition with pocomania, end of quote, and of the risk of arousing, quote, racial feeling 
Governor Arthur Richards reported to the colonial secretary in England about the danger of Rastafari arousing, quote, racial feeling. And I ask, what of the racial feeling fueling the onslaught of the state against Rastafari in 1963, the plunder of Pinnacle in 54 and the burning to the ground in 1958? Doesn't such onslaught of coral gardens match the definition of a crime against humanity? Rasta, that terrible thing, that terrible specimen of humanity, violated of the coral gardens and pinnacle plunder by the state of Jamaica, a crime against humanity indeed. Leonard the servant of the King of Kings, Howell, was harassed and arrested several times for all sorts of contrivances, including offering images and words of His Majesty to the public. Why the resentment against the humanity of Rastafari, as expressed in spreading such dangerous words and thinking and liberty of His Imperial Majesty Haile Selassie? Listen, listen, listen to dangerous words of Rastafari. First, until the philosophy, are these words dangerous? Until to whom and why? Until the philosophy which holds one race superior to another is totally and permanently abandoned and destroyed, there will be war. No first class or second class citizen of any nation. International morality for collective security. Listen to more dangerous words. Quote, Differences of race, of religion, of culture, of tradition are not insuperable obstacles to the coming together of peoples. End of quote. Listen to more dangerous words from Rastafari. Knowing that, that material and spiritual progress are essential to man, we must ceaselessly work for the equal attainment of both. Only then shall we be able to acquire the absolute inner, inner calm so necessary to our well-being. End of quote. Listen to more dangerous words of Rastafari. However wise or however mighty a person may be, he's like a ship without a rudder if he's without God, which is to say God in the logic of creation in nature. That is the expression of God. He's like a rudderless ship is at the mercy of the waves and the wind, drifts wherever they take it. It is our firm belief that a soul without Christ, and when we say Christ, the logic and spirit of creation manifest in child of creation. It is our firm belief that a soul without Christ is bound to meet with no better fate. End of quote. Properly understood, understood, acknowledging Jesus is of ancestor worship. Acknowledging Jesus is of ancestor worship. When you see the Son, you see the Father. When you see the Father, you see the Son. More dangerous words. Africans are in bondage today because they approach spirituality through religion provided by foreign invaders and conquerors. Spirituality is not theology or ideology. It is simply a way of life, pure and original as was given by the Most High of creation. Spirituality is a network linking us to the Most High, the universe and each other. End of quote of all those dangerous words of His Imperial Majesty. Dangerous words of Rastafari. Rastafari that is to be exterminated. Rastafari, that's terrible, devious, devious, terrible thing, according to Buster Manti of the Chamber of Commerce, and we shall see other leaders expressing similar views of Rastafari. We refuse to be what you wanted us to be. Now, 8 o'clock, you're inside of the Africa Forum, and the Africa Forum lecture this morning being delivered by Tekla Mekfet. We return to Tekla and of Jamaica taking Rastafari seriously. 
Why would Prime Minister Bustamante out of the 30s held feelings of Leonard Howell as a most dangerous man, seek to destroy that terrible thing they call Rastafari at Pinnacle in 1954 and in the Coral Gardens would-be genocide of 1963? There is a pattern of Bustamante's action from the 1930s right into, into Pinnacle and into Coral Gardens. We will see views shared by other leaders, other pillars of power, and we say, let law become justice. What in the national psyche of colonial peoples, calling themselves independent Jamaica, had bred such deeply cruel resentment of Rastas as Coral Garden's hyper-reaction manifested? Why would significant population find it convenient to translate acts of a few as representative of the vast majority known of peace and love identity? Is the thinking justifying the wide, widespread brutality? Isn't such convenient misthinking not of a crime against humanity in the context of the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court? Reasoning interpretation as such, and I quote, atrocity as extermination or enslavement that is directed especially against an entire population or part of a population on specious grounds, no sound grounds, and without regard to individual guilt or responsibility. End of quote. Six people, and they call it an insurrection. And they plague a whole race of people, a whole group of people, Rastafari. Encyclopedia Britannica underlines, quote, political, racial, and religious persecution of civilians. Attack against any civilian population pursuant to or in furtherance of a state organizational policy to commit such attack, end of quote. This is a crime against humanity as in Bustamante's leadership of Jamaica against Rastafari. Contemplate prophecy related to commitment and reactive standard flight of Rasta in Babylon. Today, daily, the Jamaican has an instinctive reaction to a perceived oddness, which is inferior, that is Rastafari. Even if now tolerated in some measure, influenced by perceived strange curiosity of foreigners respected. Because foreigners respect Rastafari, they give us a little attention. But basically, we are, it's an oddness that is inferior. Towards Rastafari, they are claiming a new house, superior colonial white roots as meaning for their manners. And they claim a now a sort of leniency of superiority reaction. They are patronizing our, our so-called unpalatable oddness. They indulge in intended subtle superior airs. Jamming, Bob Marley helps sharpen context. We neither beg, nor we won't bow. Neither can be bought nor sold. We all defend the right. Every day we pay the price. We are the living sacrifice to stand up for truth and rights in Jamaica. As Rastafari, you will come a living sacrifice. Thus, the magnification of behavior that is instinctive of the Jamaican manifests coalesced in the crude, cruel passion of Prime Minister Sir Alexander Bustamante, asserting the Jamaican in the 1963 Coral Gardens massacre, as it Lena reminded, never before in Jamaica a unification of the community as a whole in general resentment. And we say this is, this is Jamaica as if desperately wishing, wiping out some ugly dreaded family secret so as to be properly appreciated by the world. The purge following new birth. Irony of irony. Manifest prophecy coming forth. However, please note, for necessary movement for oneness towards shared progress, the Jamaica needs to help liberate self by seeing crucially deep significance in how the Jamaican, personified in Bustamante, sought plundering purge of the ecological concept of the pinnacle commune. 
crucially deep significance in how the Jamaican reacted to Rastafari as of the Coral Gardens massacre across Jamaica, 1963. You must see a sickness of restless, disabling sleep of identity. That is Jamaica. So we say for enabling productivity rooted truly of unification of the community out of Coral Gardens 1963 Jamaica needs to confront itself in 2014 let us look at law becoming justice Rastafari writes Coral Gardens saw genocide and pinnacle as holy place being violated what is law? Law basically is made by a legislator or political party majority elected by the masses who are courted and canvassed largely with money provided by big business, requiring its own idea of security for its own idea of prosperity. Corporate Jamaica claiming so-called rights is centrally facilitated by the democratic process of the popular vote. French existentialists Philosopher Jean-Paul Sartre identifies people who, quote, share in the responsibility of a crime of which they are the victim. The masses of Jamaica provide the vote for the governments of Jamaica to provide the needs of corporate Jamaica in their idea, idea of prosperity and law. Yet, Note Buster's intent for the most dangerous man and that terrible thing being dramatic irony of being scattered, spreading. Because as Pinnacle was scattered, so the idea and concept of Rastafari would spread. Yet, be reminded of the Lena editorial in relation to the government's reaction to Coral Gardens. Quote, the Rastafarian question is one which is still to be solved by Jamaica in much the same way as other nations everywhere have to face problems concerning, concerned with the lunatic fringes of society. Public Opinion's John Maxwell asked in bold letters, Open season on Rastas. Quote, the maximum confusion and hysteria is being generated by the government against the Rastafarians. We hold no brief for Rastafarians, but it is time to remember that they are Jamaicans and have, or should have, all the rights enjoyed by other Jamaicans. End of quote. Did Lena describe the Coral Gardens incident as an isolated case of violence and murder by a gang of six men, triggering, quote, exterminate this evil movement, end of quote. We repeat, shouldn't this be within the definition of a crime against humanity, which has no statute of limitation? Crime against humanity, atrocity, as extermination or enslavement that is directed especially against an entire population or part of a population on specious grounds and without regard to individual guilt or responsibility, even on such grounds. The Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court speaks of such crimes as, quote, are particularly odious offenses in that they constitute a serious attack on human dignity or grave humiliation or degradation of human beings. Image of Rastafari as lunatic fringes of society. Exterminate this evil movement. This terrible thing they call Rastafari. Bustamante and the Chamber of Commerce aside, the other first cousin founding father and national hero Norman Manley, distinguished lawyer, had this to say about Rasta between 1959 to 61. Here is Manley talking. If you think he loves Rasta, listen. Anything that repudiates entirely the society in any respect, religion and culture, organization of the community in which it belongs, historically and geographically, is potentially dangerous. Shake your hands out. And Norman Manley would tell the Barbados Advocate in 1960, Barbados Advocate, a newspaper in, in Barbados, that the Rastafarian movement was not around 30 years before and it would not be around 30 years hence. The man got tired to see her face. So much for the historical, cultural, and philosophical, philosophical acumen of the Oxford University trained scholar Norman Manley. But listen to some more of Manley. 
Now, when Manly's politics have appeased in Rasta by involving the University College of the West Indies research in Rasta and exploring repatriation to African countries, would be exposed in his communications with the colonial office in which his tone was of humoring the Rastas. And in Garvey scholar Professor Robert Hill's paper, the paper University College of the West Indies 1960 report on the Rastafarian movement in Jamaica, the half that has never been told, and this article, this report hasn't come in any of the major media the gleaner, and it should, because listen here. The university is exposed as essentially working for the government secret service. And documentation is given of Norman Manley instructing through Home Affairs Minister William Seawright permission to, quote, kill Rasta, end of quote. It is 2014 and Rastafari, despite the intents of national heroes and founding fathers of Jamaica, two-party democracy, Alexander Bustamante and Norman Manley and the Chamber of Commerce, Rastafari is still alive and worldwide cross-culturally respected through message of music coming of the likes of Bob Marley, Peter Tosh, Burning Spear, Lucky Dube of South Africa, and others carrying message of Rastafari, His Imperial Majesty, Haile Selassie. I. That difference of race, of religion, of culture, of tradition, are not insuperable obstacles to the coming together of people. A message of universal morality for collective security. That spirit, spirituality is not theology or ideology. It is simply a way of life, pure and original, as was given by the Most High of creation. Spirituality is a network linking us to the Most High, the universe and each other. Message in of music ever still finding resonance worldwide. So much so that Rastafari has projected Jamaica as a brand worldwide from which, ironically, the Chamber of Commerce benefits most significantly. And now, threatening with Rastafari philosophy being trivialized, vulgarized, of endorsement for private P-R-O-P-H-E-T slash P-R-O-F-I-T promotion. It's a new crossword clue conspiracy of crucifixion of Rastafari, the trivialization of Rastafari. It is 2014. Rastafari asserts its cultural integrity of being a peculiar people, ever seeking, trodding, sharing, riding rhythm of the primordial part of a network linking us to the most high, the universe and each other. A people's way of life, pure and original, as was given by the most high of creation, has been is being violated, disrespected in the government's continuing reaction to crimes against the humanity of Rastafari, which the Coral Gardens massacre and the continuing violence of the rape of the concept of the Pinnacle Commune most certainly are. And no statute of limitation is relevant to crimes against humanity. All right, you're inside of the Africa Forum, Running Africa, and the Africa Forum lecture being delivered this morning by Tekla Mikvet. The theme of Jamaica taking Rastafari seriously, significance, controversy, Coral Gardens, 1963, and Leonard Howell's pinnacle concept contemplating, complementing Marcus Garvey's holistic ideas of education, communal cultural consciousness for independently stimulating shared progress with peace. We return to Tekla Mikvet. I want us to note a, 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 a pattern of harassment of Rastafari, harassment of Leonard Howell, and it leads to Coral Garden. I want us to note a, 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 a pattern of harassment of Rastafari, harassment of Leonard Howell, and it leads to Coral Gardens, and it continues today, the disrespect, the pushing around, the double talk from government in dealing with Rastafari. Rastafari is an oddness that is inferior. Okay. Ulterior motives were sensed in the harassment of charges over the years against Leonard Howell and the Pinnacle Commune. So much so that the Attorney General, an Englishman, felt obliged to word a statement after Howell was freed in 1944 of a charge of murdering his wife. See Helen Lee's book, First Rasta. Here I quote, this is the Attorney General. If, as I believe, Pinnacle belongs to 
or is leased by Leonard Howell and his organization, the government should take no steps to break up the settlements of his followers upon that property, despite the fact that their habits and customs do not conform to those usually adhered to by civilized communities. That's how they see us, you see. But at least they say we have the right to be what we are. To eye the government of Jamaica in its treatment of Rastafari in the issues of Coral Gardens and Pinnacle is like whites treating blacks as naive niggers, perpetually patronized. Recognizing Bob Marley's Rastafarian mission, revolutionary African conscious high priestess of soul Nina Simone sings, a music recorded shortly after Bob Marley transcended. The first words are the title of the music, and I quote, I was just a dog to them. They didn't want to change, just a stupid dog to them, with a funny sounding name, Rastafari. Bob Marley died a week before Bratislava was a place to go, just a stupid dog to them, just a silly clown to them, just a stupid dog to them. Now, now, everything will change, end of Simone's music. And I, Rastafari, I say, no, no, everything must change. Law as justice now. It is 2014, and the government responding to claims of Rastafari for justice in relation to Coral Gardens and Pinnacle are saying that with Coral Gardens, the statute of limitation says claims must be made within six years of the act of infringement of rights. And so Rastafari rights are something that happened in 63 and are by and large without merit in 2014. And they are saying that other people have obtained legal rights to Leonard Howell's Rastafari pinnacle, which is only possible in collusion with a government, bad-minded, wanton abdication of sense of culture, history and justice. Law is not always of justice. In relation to Coral Gardens, apology and compensation and pinnacle rehabilitation in possession of Rastafari for the nation and the world, stop the pussyfooting and playing of insular bedfellow, mutual backscratching, catty, perverse politics. Rastafari urges all well-thinking people, let law become justice. I refer you to Isaiah 59, 14, quote, Justice is turned back, and righteousness stands afar off. For truth is fallen in the street, and equity cannot enter. Isaiah 59, 14. Let there be more fervor for law becoming justice. Close the argument by seeing the abuse of Rastafari in the issues of Coral Gardens and Pinnacle. See it as in effect crimes against humanity despite general abuse being related to any required dead quotient. Let equity enter. Let law become justice. Let the jurisprudence of power exercise in the mighty cartel or the alliance control of market profit benefiting minority, as in the alliance of government and corporate Jamaica, let such alliances serve the cause of justice, not the possibilities of malleable, putrid law. Let law become justice in respect for Rastafari rights related to coral gardens and pinnacle. Let lovers of justice join Rastafari march of fate, demanding rights long overdue. So let it be as one love for justice, not the inherent bias of inherited abusive colonial law. 18th century English philosopher Edmund Burke states, quote, All that is necessary for the triumph of evil is that good men do nothing. End of quote. And his imperial magister states, quote, Throughout history, it has been the inaction of those who could have acted, the indifference of those who should have known better, the silence of the voice of justice when it mattered most that has made it possible for evil to triumph. Join us. Get up, stand up as a Jamaican family for rightful rights, for justice. Are you ready to carry the message nationwide, worldwide? Join us. Let law become justice related to Rastafari rights in the issues of Coral Gardens and Pinnacle. Still, Every day we pay the price, seen as a, a stupid dog, silly clown, humored, as of entertaining difference. The spiritual is diminished as entertainment. 
We are curiously exotic local culture for commercializing internationally or seen as unnerving, desperate delirium of identity, vindicating self as of an idea explored of the Bible. And this idea is that a people are what they come of. And this is the idea explored by now popular 13th century Sufi poet Rumi, explored by Dante and by T.S. Eliot, of, of a primitive instinct for repatriation to being what you come of in the beginning. Leonard Howell, Bob Marley, Rastafari have been, is a living sacrifice. Now, now, everything must change. Victory out of sacrifice. Law as justice now. So let it be that little David, in outrage for his people disrespected, steps forward in faith to conquer Goliath, granting apology, compensation, restitution for the treatment of Rastafari, typified of Coral Gardens, 1963, as well as for the typically barbarous treatment of Leonard Howell and the commune of Pinnacle, finally plundered, scattered by agents of the state in 1954 and burned to the ground in 1958. So let it be. Ja live. Rastafari. Ja be praised. Speaking the raw truth, honest to the heart and from the heart, a call to action by our brother Tekla Mekvet. We note your responses on the social media. And we know that you all feel it just as we're feeling it in the studio. But this is a call to action. A call to get up, to stand up for our rights. Thank you very much, Tekla. Thank you very much. Tekla McFett will be returning at a later date for us to have a conversation about some of the main issues, pertinent issues, and they're all pertinent in this lecture raised here this morning. Tekla. Jagai, thank you, my brother. Yes, A call to action. Of Jamaica taking Rastafari seriously. Significance controversy, Coral Gardens, 1963, and Leonard Howell's pinnacle concept, complementing Marcus Garvey's holistic ideas of education, communal, cultural consciousness for independently stimulating shared progress with peace. Telling it like it is. Honestly and without the clothes on. Naked, raw truth this morning coming from the pen and the mouth of our brother Tekla Mekfet. Tekla Mekfet is an educator, broadcaster and author. His areas of research and writing include politics of color and language, cricket and cultural symbolism in sports, African philosophy in music, music and sports as instruments of education. His coming book later, later this year will be of his University of the West Indies Bob Marley lecture titled Could You Be Loved? Rastafari Reggae Bob Marley Africa Scattered for Rhythm of Spirit of Oneness for the World. We thank our brother Tekla Mekfet for coming in this morning. We really do. The research is documented. The information is documented. It is there. This is a call to action for all Jamaicans, for all African Jamaicans. As a brother says, every day we pay the price. Every day we pay, pay the price, he says. This is a time. Now. So let it be, he says, that little David in outrage for his people, disrespected, steps forward in faith to conquer Goliath, 
granting apology, compensation, restitution for the treatment of Rastafari typified of Coral Gardens 1963, as well as for the typically barbarous treatment of Leonard Howell and the commune of Pinnacle, finally plundered, scattered by agents of the state in 1954, burned to the ground in 58. Thank you very much, my brother, Tekla Megfred. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Tekla. Really appreciate uh, this lecture this morning. Really, really appreciating this lecture this morning. Just two minutes away from, just a minute away from the Supreme Ventures draw. And then after that, it will be time for Kenako Brasilia. Local and international headlines. We're speaking this morning with the Lady President of the UNIA, Valerie Dixon. Also speaking with the uh, Director, Executive Director of the or Managing Director of Liberty Hall, Donna McFarlane, as we celebrate and look forward to continuing the celebration of 100 years of Garvey's. As a matter of fact, Donna McFarlane is the Director and Curator of Liberty Hall. Listen up, top draw, dollars, pick two, pick three, pick four, cash part, early bird draws. Up next. Eight thirty-five, and Roger Haswell is standing by with Canaco Brasilia. It's Kenako Brasilia. A look at the Africa teams at football's ultimate showpiece. I'm Roger Haspel. The 2014 World Cup currently on the way in Brazil saw a new development for continental Africa. Apart from having two teams qualify to the round of 16 for the first time, Nigeria's coach Steve Keshi became the first coach of African descent to take an African team to the second round. This was achieved when the Super Eagles finished second to Argentina in their group to progress with four points, five behind the group winners. After a goalless draw against Iran, a game in which they had 70% of the possession, the Nigerians pulled off a 1-0 win over Bosnia and Herzegovina in their second game. In one of the most exciting games of the tournament, the Super Eagles went down 3-2 to Argentina, and the result only go down to the genius of Lionel Messi, who scored two of Argentina's goals. It was also a game of historical significance, as for the first time at the World Cup Finals, both teams scored with the first within the first five minutes of a game, as well as the first five minutes in the second half. Nigeria will meet France in their round of 16 match on a Tuesday and will be seeking to join the likes of Cameroon, Senegal and Ghana as the only African teams to have advanced to the quarterfinal stage. Prior to the 2014 World Cup, the record of African coaches was just one victory in 25 World Cup matches. That was achieved by Jono Sono, a South African star deprived by apartheid of a chance to display his skills at the World Cup. The Black Prince coached his country at the 2002 World Cup in South Korea, Japan. And Bafana Bafana overcame Slovenia, but Spain and Paraguay advanced, leaving the South Africans third. Nigerian Festus Unigbingi finished winless and last at the 2002 World Cup in Korea, Japan as well, including losses to Argentina and Sweden and a scoreless draw with England. Kwesi Apia, the other black African coach at this year's World Cup, tried his best, but Ghana finished at the bottom of their group with two losses and a creditable two-all draw with Germany. Outside of Keshi's achievement with Nigeria, Algeria was the other African team to make progress to the second round this year. This after finishing, runners-up with four points behind group winners Belgium with a maximum nine points. The Algerians lost their opening game to Belgium 2-1, bounced back with a remarkable 4-2 win over South Korea. They finished the group stage with a come from behind one-all draw with Russia. The Algerians will now face Germany in the round of 16 and is also hoping to be among the elite group of African teams that have made progress to the quarter-final stage. The other African teams this year, Cameroon, the Ivory Coast and Ghana, failed to make progress to the second round. 
Cameroon was the first to exit and finish their campaign with a 4-1 loss to Brazil. A sad end to a sad campaign which started off on the wrong foot even before they left the country. After the players refused to board the plane for Brazil after demanding they be paid their bonuses before they travel. The Ivory Coast was the biggest and most surprising of the exits after being highly touted to advance to the round of 16 in this their third attempt. Hopes were high with an opening game 2-1 win over Japan, followed by 2-1 losses to Colombia and Greece respectively. The loss to Greece was heart-wrenching as they conceded a stoppage time penalty ending the hopes of the golden generation of Ivory Coast players. Ghana was the other disappointment. For a team which played attractive football, the lack of final third penetration coupled with an inexperienced defence severely affected their chances. The Black Stars finished at the foot of their group with two losses and a draw. They also had their controversial moments as the Ghanaian government was forced to charter a plane to Brazil prior to their game against Portugal with monies owed to them after they had refused to have it wired to them. To top it off, just hours before the game, veteran players Kevin Prince Boateng and Sally Montari were expelled from the team for alleged insubordination. Not a good ending for the Black Stars who played the most attractive football of the African teams. Meanwhile, with his sixth career gold in the World Cup, in Thursday's 2-1 loss to Portugal, Ghana's Asamo Jian passed Cameroon's Roger Miller as the tournament's all-time leading goal scorer among African players with six goals. While disappointed with the team's early exit, he was happy for the record. Four years, we'll come back. On a personal basis, you've got the goal, so you've got that African record of scoring the World Cup all to yourself. Uh, I know it's not much consolation, but uh, your own performances you must have been pleased with. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, I'm pleased with it. You know, I've got six goals so far. But um, maybe uh, because I'm not happy right now, you know, because we've gone out. But personally, I'm, I'm happy for this record, you know, and uh, I don't know what to say. I have to just thank everybody for, for their support, the whole of Ghana. They prayed for us, and uh, I think everything is done now. But personally, I'm happy for this record. Meanwhile, Muslim players in World Cup teams who have qualified for the last 16 in Brazil face a third question. As of today, when much of the Islamic world start observing the holy month of Ramadan with a dawn to dusk fast. The question is true crest for Algeria, who faces a formidable Germany tomorrow. Muslims can also be found in a Nigerian team, and they'll have to weigh their religious convictions against the effects of fasting on their performance. While fasting during daytime over the 30 days of Ramadan, including abstaining from drinking liquids, is mandatory for Muslims, and one of the five pillars of Islam, there are exemptions, including for the sick, pregnant, infirm or elderly. Those traveling or going to war are also excluded and it's under this provision that most athletes will delay the fast until a more suitable time. In Algeria, which has been bathing in the euphoria of qualifying for the last 16 for the first time in its history, there have been a range of opinions from religious scholars with some coming out quite strongly against fasting exemptions. Algeria's government appointed High Islamic Council has come down in favor of those wanting to delay their fast. Sheikh Mohammed Sharif Kahir, the head of the body's commission for religious opinion, said those playing can abstain from fasting. Dr. Hakim Shalabi, a specialist in sports and fasting, who accompanied the team to Brazil, admitted in an interview that it is a delicate question because of the need for hydration and the increased risk of injuries. He noted that fasting was not always a total hindrance to players. He said they are often asked to urge players not to fast, but oddly, in some cases, there are athletes that get better results during Ramadan because they are fasting and want to do so. It can be a spiritual and psychological aid, he says. That was Kenako Brasilia. A look at the African teams at football's ultimate showpiece. I'm Roger Haspel. All right, thank you very much, Roger Haspel, with Kenako Brasilia.
843 news coming your way at 845. How are you doing, Mr. Roger? Hasselhoff? I'm good. I'm good today. Well, you I'm are good, good today. Yes. Yeah. Wow. Mm-hmm. Football. <laughs> World Football. Cup. Yeah, well, hey. <laughs> this is nothing is going the way that a lot of people expected. Yes. Yeah. It's true. It, it's all. It's 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 up in the air. Mm-hmm. But um, you still have the. The traditional ones still, yeah. are, some of the traditional ones still around. You know, so. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. I, I have been forced to activate my third. <laughs> <laughs> my third. <laughs> oh, this was some joke. I don't, I don't, I do not want to hear anything from Abka Fitzhenling. Do not tweet me. Do not call me. And do not write me on that. Or, or should I say Abka Brazil? And right? what is that third shirt? Um, option you have activated. I will not say. My dear lady. I will not say. <laughs> <laughs> Suffice to say that I've activated my third option. <laughs> you know very well what it is. And if you say a word, I shall slap you. <laughs> <laughs> How are you doing in the scheme of things? Well, good enough. I mean, my traditional team <laughs> is well and truly in it. Yes, Argentina is still yes, there? Yes, my tra- that's my traditional team. You know, it's shame on you, really. I, I am Why? Totally, shame on you. Why? Shame on you. Because, Argent- uh, you know, hmm. it doesn't... Argentina played who again? Which African team? They played Nigeria. And I have it on very good uh, authority mm-hmm. that you were up there, you know, in the office <laughs> jumping and cheering for Argentina. No, I mean... And, and y- y- we know Argentina is your team, but considering who mm-hmm. you are and what you do here, mm-hmm. Kanaka, Brasilia, etc. Yes. <laughs> you know, if Nigeria is playing, shut him out, man. <laughs> Behave really? yourself and keep quiet. Yes. No, in the scheme of things, you know, my yeah. overall Pan-African upbringing mm, yes. and the views and and the, all those things that yes. are associated with it, it doesn't really <laughs> come in the way of my sporting <laughs> if you're, my, you're, my sporting you know views and yes. ways of seeing things where sports is concerned right, even so. growing up in a pan-african <laughs> home <laughs> so i was always rooting for Argentina yes, with I diego maradona and those people go, from yes, long yes, time yes yes yes, yes 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 <laughs> I, I hear you i hear you <laughs> But 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 Argentina. I mean, sorry. Yes. Um, so so you still think Argentina might win this? They are going to win. They are, they are mm. going to win. I mean, mm-hmm. the boss has, has has some questions to answer, and he's answering them, mm-hmm. and he'll do so okay. right through to the end okay. of, of the tournament. Okay. <laughs> so I know who is the boss. Yes, where football yes, is yes, 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 yes. Yeah. So so how it, so how it look here now? How it look? Because um, the most the the, Europe, the top European teams are out: Spain, Italy, England. Um, who else? The European, te- more, the European yeah, well, teams are on their way. Out. Yeah, well, the, the, the biggest, the biggest ones definitely would be Italy, Spain, and uh, England. England, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, but the others are there. We have Germany, Holland, France. Mm-hmm. You know, those those teams are there. So, so Germany, Holland, France, there. Mm-hmm. That's true. Mm-hmm. And um, one of those is Madrid. <laughs> <laughs> Goodness gracious! So, so, it, it so, get, so, so uh, uh, in the scheme of things, we'll be seeing you at the end of of the tournament. You should see me at the end of a tournament. I've <laughs> 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 been activated my turn. Um, I'm sure. You you'll see me at the finals. All right. <laughs> All right. But uh, but can we just say uh, so, so? What what is happening with with Ghana and and Cameroon? Now we're hearing that the, the Cameroon and Ghana to investigate World Cup failures. Presidents of Cameroon and Ghana have called for investigations following disappointing World Cup showings that saw both countries eliminated during the group stage. So what are they investigating? Well, um, where Ghana is concerned, they, they were drawn in one of the, the group of, of deaths. Mm-hmm. Uh, unfortunately, um, they, they didn't make it out. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, the, for the Ghana team, for me, in my opinion and what, and what I saw, definitely one of the most attractive playing team on the field um i i think uh, they suffered because you know ghana was the youngest team on average at, at the world cup and they had a very young defense and a, and a, and, a, and based on the two matches that they lost it was inexperienced defending mm-hmm. that 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 caused those goals and they also had uh a lack of proper final third execution in in the games that they lost as well mm-hmm. and uh, um this, this the second game they played against germany they they, they brought everything mm-hmm. um to that game and it was a fantastic to all draw germany mm-hmm. but the unfit the off field is again was another thing where 
they, they, we also see on, on, on pictures, we have the same defender who, who gave away the goal in the last game. Because the Ghana government flown monies by a charter plane prior to the game because mm-hmm. the players were demanding that they, 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 they want, have it not wired to them. Right. <laughs> they want it. And there's a picture of the same fellow, boy. Mm-hmm. <laughs> kind of show off thing with the money that the he money. collected <laughs> you know prior to the prior to I, the game and know? then give and then giving away the goal yes yeah, so. yeah, the money get to them head you know you know there's yeah. something there's some uh, you see we talk i i, I hear i don't i, I think they Mm. commentary on the African teams I find the commentary very biased not on TV, not just generally among ourselves among mm. people generally I find it biased in that you have a lot of European teams, top European teams who are not not, not advancing to the, to, the, to the next round mm, true. as you have African teams not advancing to the next round mm. and at the same time you have Europe investing much more in football, mm. having much better clubs, <coughs> having a structure Facilities in place, so yeah, to deal with football, mm-hmm. which Ghana and say, which the African teams do not necessarily have mm-hmm. so to have two teams and then the thing that we, when we when we, when people talk about this, you don't see that. You know, I had to say to somebody the other day that no, two teams from Africa have gone through. Mm-hmm. Um, Algeria and Nigeria have moved on to the second round. England is not there. True. What is your problem? Is Spain is not, is not there. You know, yeah. Italy yeah. is not there. So what yeah. is your problem talking yeah. about the African teams doing badly? Yeah. Well, it, to me, I, I think the cup is either half full or it half empty. And for me, it is half full. Two gone through. Algeria, I never did with Algeria. Algeria, I'm a brethren, you know. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, <laughs> they, 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 they are one of the continent's five representatives, so we can't escape that. No, and it was yeah. uh, five teams yes. from the continent yes. that made it to the cup, mm. and two are gone through. Yes. That, that percentage, that average, mm. much better than what you have been doing <laughs> 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 at this stage. Yes. And I'm just saying off the top of my head, so nobody mm. can't move the numbers, but I yeah. think if you percent the thing out, mm. you find it's a much higher percentage than what Europe is doing right yes, now. Yes, because CONCACAF you know? have three out of four advancing, mm-hmm. and Africa two out of Five. Uh, uh, five. So of yeah. the sixteen, of the sixteen, there would have what five, five from five, including Kankakaf and Africa, and the remainder would be. The remainder of the sixteen would be some Latin America. No, nah, not no, no, Europe, and Europe. Europe. Yes. So what yes. about? Okay. Mm-hmm. So all, all Latin American teams are Kankakaf. Yes. Well, Latin America would include Brazil and so on. Yeah, yeah. It, it include Central anything South, and it Central anything and South. South of the United States. Right, but Concacaf itself now it, it yeah. includes the United States, Canada, mm-hmm. and, right, and, and right. so on, and mm-hmm. Mexico uh, and Caribbean. So how did Brazil do? I mean, I didn't see the matches yesterday. Well, I'm so sorry, I, I didn't. I didn't. See Brazil any escaped by the skin of their teeth. Literally, literally, literally escaped. Yes, and Brazil, uh, and almost. And You're uh, hanging on by just yes. a small thread, my yes, brother. Yes, and we had a thread. joke going around that yes. the real hero in the game yesterday was the goalpost. <laughs> 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 so, I'm sorry I missed the penalties so I need to yes. watch that match somewhere yeah. I need to yeah. find it yeah. oh, those, I love penalties yes you know? yes <laughs> you know but, but they are through and um, I mean the Brazilian fans will say well you know we are, we are plugging along yeah, you know, yeah. And, um, and so on I mean it's it like ugly but good we are them. plugging along you know mm. so, and America is, is off to the, to the second round yes the United States they will play Belgium Mm-hmm. And uh, of course, they finished second in the group of death there with Ghana and Germany and so on. Mm-hmm. And um, so, the United States will be playing Belgium, Mexico playing today. Mm-hmm. The first game actually mm-hmm. at eleven o'clock. Yeah, I see. Another. I see two of my teams playing today. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Mexico playing the Netherlands and yes. Costa Rica and Greece. Yes, mm. yes. So it's it's the, um, both games. Costa Rica actually from CONCACAF too. Yeah. So two CONCACAF teams will be playing today. Is Costa Rica a surprise? Yes, you know, because they were in one of the group of deaths. They were in a, in a group that include, included three mm-hmm. former World Cup winners. Mm-hmm. Does this yeah. represent uh, a, a change in the balance of power in football, do you think, World Cup in particular? Yes, it is heading in that direction. Mm-hmm. Um, how we see, oh, we are seeing Costa Rica and Mexico so comfortable now playing against the traditional powerhouses and mm-hmm. beating them mm-hmm. and dominating them. Um, it is showing that 
you know, um, there's definitely Something a change. Changing. Mexico, actually, you know, Mexico is a current Olympic champion, you know, so mm -hmm. and a number of the, those players are playing in this World Cup. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And um, um, traditionally, in the, especially in the early days, the Olympic teams um, that, that, that would have won at the Olympics would, 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 would be the dominant team in the Cena World Cup. We saw it from Uruguay in 1930. Mm -hmm. They were the Olympic champions prior to that, 1950, and other teams as well. Mm -hmm. um, so so it's, a, it, it's a touch and go where Mexico is concerned. I expect them to give Netherlands a very, 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 very good game today. And but you don't I, expect Netherlands to lose? I expect. I expect anything, you know, because <laughs> game, <coughs> uh, normally each round, e e e each, do, e these knockouts. I would not round. like to, up, to, to to activate my <laughs> my fourth option. Oh my lord! <laughs> yeah, but, but um, these rounds tradi yeah, tradi yeah. traditionally is always a little one upset in the, in in the wings, you know. Yeah, well, let's so do something. Somewhere. You know, it's the first time in in, mm. in the history of a World Cup that I find myself in this position. <laughs> yeah. You know, I'm activating third and oh fourth choices, and so. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, I carried the winner last year. Yeah, you did. And the year before. <laughs> <laughs> Not only did I carry the winner last year, I mm. carried the two finalists. My dear. You know, My dear. and I carried the, 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 the winner the year before. <laughs> I mean, the, and the, I the, guess the, you'll the, be the there at the end of before. this year. Eh? I'll, I'll, and I guess you'll be at the end of this one as it well. Gone, it bad for me already because <laughs> <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> my two finalists are out. <laughs> so my situation is really bad. Yeah. But um, but I've activated my third option and I think mm. I, I think we, we'll watch and see uh, what happens. Okay, yeah. we'll After see. that, me done. Mm. You right, know, right. I just watch it for we'll I just see. watch it like the ordinary people. We'll see, we'll see. <laughs> because see we know Jamaica at stayed a bit. Yeah. Even, even if but I'm not a Jamaican, I'm a football lover. Even if Greece go through, you'll start, you'll start hearing people say we. <laughs> After what? Even if Greece got you, you'll start your feeling say, well, we'll go through, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, Jamaica, you know, um, <laughs> no, we say I'm not a Jamaican. I'm mm. a football lover. Mm. I, I'm not a Wagonist. No, no, I said you so are so I'm just saying. Don't, don't mix me up. I have seen, I have seen a lot of teams. I mean, I remember yeah. in 19 when I think it was 1994 when Bulgaria they made a good run. Eh? Mm. I hear a lot of people say, "Boy, this is how we beat the boy." Then. <laughs> we, we, <laughs> you know, say, we, Bulgaria, we. <laughs> <laughs> So you, 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 uh, when Argen, where they are, no. so you're saying a similar thing for Ag Argentina, aren't you? No, I've, I, 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 the last time I, the last time I won a World Cup was in 1986. Um, mm, wow, so. wow, I, that's um, bad. Yeah, bad. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I can't even find a, a, a comforting word for you. But it's just bad. Yes, and, and we went yeah. to the final in 1990. You know, the last uh, time that. Um, that team went to the final. But yeah, your situation yes. is not so good. Well, yes. let's see. Let's see. Um, lots of uh, surprises. You mm. never know. And, and there are one million. Argentina not looking And there are one high. million black people living in us in Argentina. So what does that have to do no, with I'm anything? Just, wait, just, wait, 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 no, no, nothing, wait. nothing, nothing. There are a lot of black people living in Holland. Yes. No, because I mean, you, 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 mm. you, you, I mean, I mean, a lot of people say that you know, Argentina is the whitest of the. The, oh, the, the Latin that. teams. Oh, I see what you mean. Yeah. You have a dilemma. Yeah. No, not necessarily <laughs> because I mean, when I when, when you I did, find when, yourself in a dilemma. When I, when I did my research, yes. we, um, we have seen a, a lot of players of yes, African descent that have represented Argentina. A lot of Pan-Africanist football lovers mm -hmm. are, are having a hard time with this World well, Cup. Yeah. You see, because <laughs> 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 I, I, my my suggestion mm -hmm. to Pan-Africans mm -hmm. watching the World mm -hmm. Cup: just go with a team. Mm -hmm. You know, when I don't repent. No, 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 no repent. I mean, I the match, don't repent. We, 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 we'll always be sentimental to, to the team that represents the motherland. You know? Just choose a Well, you know, Africa is in, a, is in its own little place, of yes. course. And then after you, you know, after you put on Africa nicely, then, mm -hmm. you know, you said this is it. Mm -hmm. Then just go, just choose a team, a football. Yeah, football no? it be. Bro. Yeah, yeah. sport. Yeah. All right, so thank you very much, Mr. Roger Haspo. You're We're looking welcome. forward to the matches today. Definitely. So Mexico and, and Holland first. Yes, and then it's Costa Rica against Greece. All right. Yeah. Well, we have a long day ahead of yes. us. And, do, and remember that, that, Argent, that uh, Nigeria will be playing France um, mm. on Tuesday and Algeria playing Germany. 
Well, there you go. Mm-hmm. All right, lots to look forward to. Thank you, Mr. Kanaka Basilia. Yeah, what well, good? Tell him all about Hodi. Definitely. You're inside of the Africa Forum, Running African. Nine minutes now after nine o'clock, you're inside of the Africa Forum. It is Running African. And uh, Sister Gloria, my sister. You know, we've been talking a lot to Sister Gloria. She's been uh, on the road in Suriname. And uh, and uh, we linked with her when she went to the conference. As a matter of fact, whenever she travels out uh, to Suriname, we always make that quick link with with Sister Gloria. Well, last uh, week, uh, she was in an elaborate traditional ritual, um, one that we've never seen in Jamaica before. Uh, She was actually installed as Gamang, a paramount chief by the Okasini Maroons of Suriname that was last week, and that took place at the Charlestown Maroon Asafu Yard in Portland. Going to go to the phone lines? Uh, Sister Gloria was scheduled to be in the studio, but she's actually up in the hills filming <laughs> uh, in part of a documentary that is being done uh, there on uh, about uh, Queen Nanny of the Maroons. And so we join her from the mountain. Sister Gloria, good morning. Good morning, Sister Andrea. Good morning. Good morning to Jamaica. Yes, I'm all not pleased about your battle shot and oppressed. I said there's a ray of light. Sister Gloria, so so, uh, with this installment, uh, your title now is what? Gamma. Gamma. So the G is silent. Yeah, they say Gamma. Gamma. G-A-A-M-A-N-G. That's how they call it over there. Gamma. Okay, okay. But but in English spelling, it is G-A-A. N A Gamma. Okay, Gamma. And and, and yeah. that is that is that is similar to Paramount Chief, what we know as Paramount yes, Chief? Paramount Chief, <coughs> yes. It's a lifetime um honor and your um that, that making Suriname the Gamma is chief of over all the chiefs. Mm-hmm. So he he's the one that they give all the they come to him for Anything at all they do, whatever they is in, is, is they have in mind to so mm-hmm. either um, establish or be established, they will take it to the government for his, his honor or his blessing, you know. All right. Well, let me just congratulate you on this installment. Um, what does it mean for you in Jamaica? Um, and, 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 and then talk about how it works in Suriname. But just quickly, what does that mean in Jamaica in terms of the maroon community itself? Well, um, you know that it, it, it was never here before. When we went to the Daman after we signed the Memorandum of Cooperation in the Maroon Women Conference that I attended, yes. we had to take the document up to, to him, you know, and it's a protocol you have to go to the commission, the district commissioner first. So when when um, it was given to me, it, 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 we realized that there was never yet a gammon in Jamaica. So you, you said without the gammon in Jamaica, then, then the Maroon government has never been established. Okay. And then we, we are not free, so we, we need to have that, because that is how the government is in, instituted, and it is what they save off what, what they, that they know from Africa when they take them there, they run to the hills and immediately institute what they know as a governance. Mm-hmm. How, so, do, how, does your, how does this insulation work with, uh, say, um, how you relate now and what the, relate, what the relationship is among the, the colonels? Because now we in, yeah. in Jamaica we have colonels. Yeah, um, yeah, how does that yeah. work? Are you the head of all yeah. the colonels? Well, it, you, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's something that has never been in Jamaica before, mm-hmm. you know? So it's new to them. So um, what I'm doing now, even though it's not new, so an ancient way that we should have preserved, mm-hmm. if we preserve anything at all. So um, what I am, I'm here, I know I have to use a lot of tolerance and understanding and humility, you know, and in dialogue so that there's not, you do not want to work with a conflict because... I, I am here for unity, and when I set out the spirit that works with me, when I set out on a mission, it has, you know, to be accomplished. That is where I stand. 
All in right. my life. Whatever it takes for me to accomplish the mission, that is my focus. So whatever I have to do, whatever diplomacy, whatever humility, whatever tolerance, whatever forbearance that is, the spirit has equipped me with that, these energies to be there, to see to you that the mission is done. So that is where I stand. All right, I understand yes. perfectly. And, and then when you... When you, when you co- they said, I, I, as they institute me, they said I am the first female, so that made me clean of all. It's not just, it's just the African culture. It stands for Rastafari. It stands for the Africanness that we have around here. There's no division. There's no divide and conquer energy in what we are doing. You understand? All right. So, so we, we, I am I think up against a lot of defenses. I, am, I know that there will be defenses. I know there will be offenses. I know that you know, one will not want it to go, but I am standing on what my ancestors preserve, what they died for, what they fought for, what they suffer for, the ancestral... All right, um, Sister Gloria, when, one of the things I want you to do is that, obviously, we still expect you to come into the studio and we talk yes. some more about what it entails politically, because uh, it is also a political... Uh, um, Office, so that when you come into the studio, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, in terms of the ceremony itself, ins- itself, installation ceremony, what did it involve? Well, it involved the traditional way how our ancestors coming from Africa, how they install using the herbs, using indigenous things, going to the environment like the river, as they are the river people, as you say, we are the mountain maroons. And they are the river marine. So when the mountain meets the river, then things are possible. So when we, when, when, when they use the river and they take me and cleanse me first at the river with herbs that they brought down with them from, uh, from Suriname and they put me through that whole procedure. Now they have a way to give you greater honors and they know it's, 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 it's to the eyes. So what they did was install my king man with me. So as to balance the energy so that I don't, you know, feel like I'm too over. There's always a balance. So I, 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 um, and what they did was go through the whole installment of how to put it. Because we, here we see some of our ancestral people who say they save the ancestral legs and using this way of the, some of our ancestral people who say they save the ancestral legs and using this way of the Jamaican electoral system for things. So hopefully this will shed a light in, the, in, 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 in this corner to see that there is a traditional way of our ancestors. Um, know that their, their people was installed. Sister Gloria, Sister Gloria, we're going to leave it there. I just wanted to make a quick link with you because I know that you're filming now and so on uh, in yes. the interest of time. But I still invite you to come into the studio when you have time so that we can yes. go through um, what the office means to talk about the installation, uh, which was really I understand and I heard from persons who were there, including Nana Eseboa, that it was quite something to, to witness. Nana Eseboa, of course, Sister Minnie. Thank you very much, my sister. And we'll talk when you come in. Thanks for having me, yeah, man. And blessed love to Jamaica. Thanks, man. And I know the struggle, I know the pain, I feel in the pain. But I said this morning, strength, there's a light in the darkness. Give, give thanks, my sister. All right. Uh, installed as Gamang, as Sister Gloria, and the process on Sunday. Um, as Paul Williams is reporting in The Observer, was accumulation of what uh, uh, that started in Suriname last year when Sister Gloria spent a month as a guest of the Moon Women's Network. You'll recall that we talked with her from Suriname a few times. And uh, the installation um, involved river cleansing and uh, uh, what we, just by looking at the pictures, it, 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 sim- it seems similar to me, and I don't know, I wasn't there, to some of what he's done um, with uh, fetish priests in Ghana. Uh, Sister uh, Nana Eseboa can probably tell me otherwise. Then there's also the ceremonial stool. Uh, that was involved in that. There's a story in the Jamaica Observer today uh, written by Paul Williams in which you can learn much more about what happened there. So congratulations to Sister Gloria. We'll hear more from her about the installation as Gamma.
the essence of power is the ability to define someone's reality and have them live according to that definition as though it is a definition of their own choosing. Once again, we say that the IMF in Jamaica and Christ uh, Lord God, who is uh, actually Christine Lagarde, uh, who was in Jamaica just this weekend, defining our reality to us. And that is the essence of power. Uh, we see it, we saw this playing out in front of our very own eyes. The extent to which the uh, Bretton Woods institutions continue to wield this power over diaspora African and continental Africans. It is a travesty. But we also see, saw the extent to which uh, those in positions of leadership sucked up and soaked up and reveled in some of what she had to say in terms of the extent to which she was with her powerful self defining our reality to us. And then the way we're turning around this morning and accepting that reality and living within that reality as if we chose that definition of our reality for ourselves. Powerful people are these um, persons from the IMF and so on. Powerful, powerful people. And if they are so powerful, what does that make you? You know, we've got a few questions to ask before our next interview. The, as we continue to blaze new paths towards Africa's uh, rendezvous with destiny. We still have 300, just about 300 young girls who have disappeared, who have been disappeared in Nigeria by Boko Haram. Bring back our girls. Uh, the hashtag is not even trending anymore. But these 300, just about 300 girls still haven't been found. And we have heard that more women have been kidnapped in Nigeria. Question is, what are we going to do about our plight wherever we are? Another question has to do with the treaty signed between the British and the Maroons. Is that treaty still valid? Because we understand that at the Maroon event at Charlestown, a South Yard, that the uh, Minister Golding uh, talked about the extent to which the Maroons might have and hope we're not taking tales out of school, but we understand, allegedly, that he said that the Maroons might be the ones with the power in Jamaica to plant ganja without um, the kind of repercussions that others would have. Am I taking, is this true? Did he say that? And if he said that, what does that mean? And I'm saying he allegedly said it. <laughs> what does that mean if he actually said it? But the question, is the treaty still valid? Is the treaty between the Maroons and the British still valid? And if it is valid, and let us say that we had a situation like we see in Egypt or the Morant Bay Rebellion or that we see happening even Haiti or anywhere else because we see a lot of, a lot of changes taking place. Would the Maroons side with the British, of which Jamaica is still a part of the Commonwealth and also um, ruled um, <clears throat> through the Governor General by the British. Is the treaty between the British and the Maroons still valid? Did anybody void that treaty? Is that treaty still valid? And if it is still valid, what does it mean? Question. Another question is, what happened to the heritage site lot earmarked at Pinnacle? What happened to that lot that was earmarked at Pinnacle to be a heritage site? That's another question. And then we have been asking, we have been asking this question, um, how come there's a Confucius Institute at UWE and there's no Garvey Institute up there? We need a Pan-African Institute. You heard Tekla McFett in his lecture this morning talked about a Pan-African centre in, in Sudan. But how come there's a Confucius Institute at UWE and there's no Garvey Institute or African Institute for that matter? We're watching the Walter Rodney Commission of Inquiry. It is still on. Justice for Walter Rodney. That Commission of Inquiry into the assassination of Walter Rodney is still on. We're watching the extent to which genetically modified products continue to come into our island uh, willy-nilly. We're also looking at the plans to make beaches available, access to Jamaica's beaches. We're watching those. 
We're also watching the militarization of Africa and the Caribbean waters. AFRICOM, CBSI. Just a few things we have our eyes on. We're watching China and Jamaica because we're saying that to understand China in Jamaica, we have, you know, a lot of examples that we can look to. And one of that, of course, is understanding China and looking at and understanding China and Africa. It's not all good. Not all bad, but not all good. All right, so we want to go to the phone lines to speak with Lady President of the UNIA ACL, uh, Valerie Dixon, who is going to be talking to us about the plans for the celebration, 100th year of Garveyism. Standing by to speak with Valerie Dixon. Good morning, Valerie. Thank you for joining us inside of the Africa Forum. Good morning, Kabu, and good morning, Jamaica, right. and good morning to the rest of the world. Thanks for joining us, Valerie Dixon, of course, Lady President of the UNIA ACL in Jamaica. Earlier this morning, I spoke, uh, Valerie, with Delia Harris of the Ministry of Culture, and she pointed out that the ministry is working with the UNIA in Jamaica for the 100th uh, celebration of Mwalimu Marcus Mazaya Garvey. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about that? What is the partnership like? Well, the partnership is a good one because the government is actually recognizing the importance of this special celebration, this milestone celebration of the UNIA ACL. So a number of the activities, and I must point out that our activities are really in progress. We're in progress of finalizing these activities that will take place during our year of celebration. Uh, well, it's now almost July. The year started in January. Well, yes, we have been doing things, I mean, but the main focus will be what happens from July 20th, where um, we all know that this was the time that the UNIA ACL was founded. And Scott's Kirk, by the way, the word Kirk means church, Scott's Kirk, situated at 56 Church Street, played an integral role in the UNIA's early years. You see, it must be remembered that the UNIA did not have its own meeting place or headquarters until 1923 when it acquired premises at 76 King Street. So the early mass meetings were held in the hall at Scottskirk, and this hall was called the Collegiate Hall. So we're hoping to have a church service at Scott's Kirk on this particular day, July 20th. Okay, then so on July 20, which is, uh, and this service will be the centennial service as you'll Yes, the centennial service right. for the UNIA. All right, and then from there... And then um, further in the evening, in the afternoon at 2 p.m., there will be a lecture at the Institute of Jamaica. Mm -hmm. And our president, Mr. Stephen Golden, will be the guest speaker. Mm-hmm at this particular lecture. All right. So two things happening on July 21 is a centennial service and the other one is in the Institute of Jamaica, the lecture of the Institute of Jamaica yes. in, the, in, the, in the evening. That's right. right. And, and there, are other stuff, there are other things in between that leading up to August 17. Um, oh, yes. yes tell us, tell us about I'll just those. quickly let you know that most of these things are in the process. Are, it's, it's a process because between July 21 to July 25, we hope to be doing some signage at the early addresses associated with the UNIA. And one such address was where the concept of the UNIA was actually born. That is at 121 Orange Street. Right. And I noticed that you said you hope to be doing. So you're saying that this is not yet... Is well, that, nothing is, is written in stone. All right. Nothing but, but, is written. But is it written? Is it written? Well, let me put it this way. It is written, and okay. we're hoping that all will be well. All right. And then on July, and this is between July no, 21 and 25. I just quickly want to point out these significant places. 121 Orange Street, 
which was the apartment rented by Marcus Garvey, 34 Charles Street. And 34 Charles Street was actually the office space for the UNIA that was rented by Amy Ashwood. I don't think she was Amy Ashwood Garvey at the time, but she was instrumental, and she was actually a co-founder, along with Marcus Garvey, of the founding of the UNIA. So space for an office was rented at 34 Child Street. And then there was 67 Slipe Road, which was the international headquarters. And this was called Eloise Park. We kept, he kept the name from probably the owner who he bought the place from. And this was a center operated by Marcus Garvey. And it played a very, very integral role in the education, entertainment. It was a meeting place. And so um, when you say signage um, to these places, what would the signs look like? Is that you're putting up I story, have, story To be words? honest with you, mm-hmm. I would have to leave that to the persons who are actually involved who in making... These, well, our president, Stephen Golden, is mm-hmm. also instrumental in... Um, working out what this signage will look like. Okay. And I don't want to really... But I'm um, asking this because you, you've, you've given so much information, you're giving so much information about these places. I'm wondering if it, 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 what we find there will be storyboards yeah. or just signs, signs saying this is... I believe place, it know? should be educational. So I'm expecting it to be more than just a sign. Okay. But okay. to give some story as to why these places are significant. Mm-hmm. All right. And there are no storyboards at these places yet? Not yet. I think that the history is just being unearthed. Yes. So it will take a a little time, but we're hoping to get there. I don't know about the history just being unearthed, um, Valerie. I mean, I've been hearing about these places since 1990 at least. um, All right. So, so, and then July 27 is the... Mass meeting in Montego Bay. Mm -hmm. We'll be doing a recruitment drive in Montego Bay. So that would be on July 27th. Then... July 31st, this is where we're going to partner now with the government because at the Emancipation Jubilee, which will be held at Seville Heritage Park, Mm -hmm. this is the annual event put on by the Heritage Trust in St. Anne, and the NIA will bring greetings this year in recognition of the centennial. So that's what the partnership is, the NIA bringing greetings? Well, let me put it this way, Andrea. We have been invited to bring greetings this year in recognition of the centennial. But that doesn't sound like a partnership. That's an invitation. Well, let me put it this way again. The government is working with the UNIA in recognition of the centennial this centennial year. But and I think that that is good because we're now together. So if we're together, then to my mind, that serves but as... Valerie, I'm a, I can only be a journalist. I can be what I can be. And so I heard from the ministry this morning through Delia Harris that there's a partnership between the ministry and the UNIA. I am listening to you. So far, you don't even know if the story boys are going to go up. And I'm sure, I bet you anything behind that is funding. Um, so the government could fund that. The next thing is that, here. We, so you said this is where the partnership is going to be. Emancipation Jubilee at Civil Heritage Park. But the partnership is the UNIA invited to bring greetings. That does sound like any partnership to me. That's well, Andrea, you can, you can invite quite, anybody to, to bring greetings. That's not a partnership. That's an invitation. To be quite honest with you, I am positive in going forward. And I believe that in time... But, 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 but despite your positivity, can you answer whether or not there's a partnership between the UNIA and the, uh, the, the Ministry of Culture? Um, without being put on the spot, let me take off my lady president hat and say that I believe that there is a partnership between the government and the UNIA ACL. All right. And then August 1, you're moving to Montego Bay? Yes, to the Jerk Festival, where I will bring greetings. And it's a little bit of twinning Marcus Garvey and his whole role and the the, the role of the Maroons and Marcus Garvey being a Maroon himself and the Maroon and their connection with Jerk and the Tainas, all of that will be um, played out at the Montego Bay Jerk Festival. All right, and I see now that later on, on August 3, that there's another big event. Right, there's a big event taking place. It's 
actually our monthly mass meeting mm -hmm. and we're hoping that this one will be really special seeing that it is our centennial year. Mm -hmm. Another interesting development is that we will take part in the anti Roche Festival on August 5. Now the anti Roche Festival, as you know, Miss Lou was very much in charge of, of um, anti Roche bringing that sort of awareness to children in particular and adults too. And this anti Roche festi um, film festival, we're going to be featuring a short film based on an audio recording by Amy Ashwood Garvey. And it's talking about the founding of the UNIA. It's, it runs for maybe about 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. So that will give us some more history there as to the important role that Amy Ashwood played in the founding of the UNIA. And I see, uh, Valerie, that um, there is an international conference that is scheduled for August 11 to 15. Yes. Can you say something about Yes, that? this is open only to members. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, we are going to be looking at a lot, at quite a number of items that we think are germane and important to Marcus Garvey and to our members. So we're going to be looking at topics that the membership will be dealing with. Okay, so you expect, and it says international conference, you expect yes. other members from across the world, from across the world uh, to come in for that conference. Will be coming for that. And then August 17, which is actual, the actual birth date of Mother right. Marcus Messiah Garvey, I, um, what's happening there? I need to let the whole world know, and Jamaica in particular, that this year our awards function will be at Devon House, and it's on a Sunday, and it's going to start a little earlier than the other Garvey Awards functions that we've been having. So please bear in mind that this will begin at 3 o'clock at Devon House. Mm -hmm. And the, this annual event is to recognize ordinary Jamaicans doing extraordinary things. Mm -hmm. So please remember that this year, the starting time, will, the beginning time for this function will be at 3 p.m. All right. And then and you're wrapping up on August 20? Wrapping up now on August 20. Well, we won't really wrap up because, as I said, we have ongoing things right through to next year when the year ends. Yes. But on August 20, the UNIA film series that began in May will take place, which took place every Wednesday, and we're going to be having it at Maskell Square, which is our food court in Crossroads, operated by three members of the UNIA who actually have a food court where we do um, food and we come together in solidarity I've with heard each about other. That. Yes, yes. I've heard about one that. is Africa C Cafe, mm -hmm. African food served only. But, the, but, but listen, you're not, you're not going to do the Africa Cafe and all the others going to advertise on Ari. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay. All right. But just to let you know that it's a food court. Yes, And yes. our whole purpose not, is for improvement. We're not doing any, we're not doing any, any, I any free, any free I, ads on the commercial I station. I quite understand. Yes. But that shows you where we are headed. Yes. And we have started training for our members, Rada and Jacef are playing some vital roles in training our members in agro-processing and in um, how to manage businesses. So we're starting to um, get our members involved now to realize that their improvement is tantamount, but they are the ones who have to take that Thank you very initial much. step. Thank you very much, Valerie. All right, Valerie Dixon there, Lady President of the UNIA ACL in Jamaica, giving an idea of some of the events uh, that are planned uh, to celebrate 100 years of Garveyism in Jamaica. Right after this, we're going to be going back to the phone lines to speak with the Director and Curator of Liberty Hall uh, in Jamaica, Donna McFarlane. Now, 940, you're inside of uh, the Africa Forum. It is Running African. And, uh, of course, we're looking at the activities leading up uh, to the celebration of 100 years of Garveyism. By the way, July 20 marks the exact date 
July 20, the exact date, 100 years ago, that the UNIA ACL was formed, started by Moalimu Marcus Mazaya Garvey. On August 17, here at IRFM, on the grounds of IRFM, in the courtyard of IRFM, we too are celebrating as usual. And this year, we're celebrating 100 years of Moalimu Marcus Mazaya Garvey. We're starting from downtown as usual. And... Um, we're coming with the marching bands and the children, and we've got all the marching bands already confirmed. The cadets, the uniformed groups, and so on will be marching from downtown Otorias to the courtyard of IRFM. Once we get into the IRFM, we've invited from Chicago, from the UNIA, Shaka Barak, to be with us in Jamaica. He will be our main guest speaker on the day. And in addition to that, there'll be so much more happening on the day here. The African uh, marketplace, the African food court, uh, and just the African vibing happening on the grounds here in the courtyard of IRFM on August 17th starting at 6 a.m. as we celebrate 100 years of Moalimu Marcus Mazaya Garvey. And the annual Liberty Hall uh, lecture will be taking place on the 17th. Donna McFarlane is the director and curator of Liberty Hall. We're standing by to speak to her about that. Education is a political dynamic. As we go to the phone lines to speak with my sister Donna McFarlane. Donna McFarlane, good morning. Good morning, Kabu. How are you? I am doing very well. I got your desperate message. I know. So nice to hear you again. <laughs> yes, yes. Well, here we are. I'm very happy that you could still join us. Yes. yes All right. Yes. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Of course, of All right, uh, Donna. So Liberty Hall, as usual, the annual Moalimu Marcus Messiah Garvey lecture. But this year, 100 years of Garveyism. Tell us about what will be happening at Liberty Hall. What form the lecture will take? Who's coming okay. into this? Well, before we talk about the lecture, let me just say that you know our commemoration or recognition and recognition of the 100 years of the UNIA began in February, yes. where we brought together 320 student teachers from all the eight teachers' colleges around Jamaica, mm -hmm. as well as the three departments of education in the universities in Jamaica, at the conference center. We partnered with Medgar Evers College, you know, uh, uh, yes. a historical black college in New York City, and they had 80 of their student teachers. And the the conference theme was looking at the UNIA ACL and how through its activities and organization it supported and built self-identity and self-reliance. Wow, yes. It was really a wonderful conference. Mm -hmm. The guest speaker we had several, but the guest speaker was Dr. Joyce King whose book on black education, she's out of uh, Atlanta, University of Georgia. Mm -hmm. And it was really a wonderful event. We also had a, a, a Kamawaudi Knife who spoke about entrepreneurship. And we had uh, Dr. Brown from, from Medgar. Yes. So it was really a wonderful whole day event. Mm -hmm. And through video cast, this link, video conferencing, our students were able to converse with the students in New York. Mm -hmm. So that was really a wonderful program and we got lots out of that. Mm -hmm. Then after that now, August 1st, which is the day, the actual day that Garvey chose to launch the UNIA mm -hmm. onto the world stage. Mm -hmm. And as you know, that's Emancipation Day. He mm -hmm. never did anything that, you know, everything that he did had a specific significance. And I think he was thinking perhaps of a re-emancipation through mm -hmm. the UNIA of the people of Jamaica. Mm -hmm and the world, the black people, wherever they are. So the purpose of, of, of our launch uh, of, is to have a program called Harambe, which is Let's All Get Together. And it's to celebrate the 100th uh, anniversary of the launch. And that's on and August 1? That's August 1st. At, at Liberty at Hall? At Liberty Hall at 76 King Street. What from time? From 10 a.m. Mm -hmm. to 5 p.m. Okay, so we can... Okay, great. So, so persons will get a chance. Persons who are leaving Seville who want to yes. come by there can leave yes. Seville and do that. Yes. And of yes. course, the theme is Up You Mighty Race. You mm -hmm. can accomplish what you will. Mm -hmm. And on the event, we'll, we have invited people who actually uh, represent that self-reliance mm -hmm. through their through businesses that they have uh, uh, created yes. that utilize mainly Jamaican raw materials 
to create, process, and manufacture products for sale. So these will include medicinal products, jewelry, fashion, all of those things. So we're asking people who do that to come and exhibit their stuff then. We'll also, in the Garvey Great Hall, mount the Garvey Centennial Exhibition that was donated by the Schomburg, which actually shows the UNIA throughout the world, as well as a great uh, uh, <coughs> in, uh, emphasis on the UNIA in Harlem. Mm -hmm. Because, as you know, these are the iconic photographs of yes. James Van Der Zee, yes. who was the official photographer of the UNIA. Mm -hmm. We'll also air in the Multimedia Museum, the Garvey Multimedia Museum, uh, three speeches that have been uh, sort of redone on DVD by Delixino, a brother out of Atlanta, from 78 Records. And these speeches are upon return to the United States, an explanation of the objects of the UNIA, and the whirlwind speech. So this will be also, will be shown in the Garvey Museum, mm -hmm. as well as uh, other films on Garvey, the Black Star Line, etc. Yes. We'll also have on that day conversation with el elder Garveyites, specifically Sister Samad mm -hmm. and uh, Brother Simon Clark. Yes. Both of them were children during the UNIA movement, and they were part of the juveniles, mm -hmm. that group within the UNIA. Mm -hmm. True, Mr. yes. Samad in Harlem and Simon Clark in Panama. Yes, So yes. this will be a conversation, and we'll hear more about what And what date is this? What date is this? This is also on the 1st. On the 1st. Wow. Yes. Sounds addition, good. <laughs> we'll have our children, because, yes. you know, we have a summer program every mm -hmm. year, mm -hmm. and our summer program will only last four months, uh, sorry, four weeks this year, yes. and it will be Garvey oration. Our mm -hmm. children will be taught to, to recite Garveyism, and they will present their, their program or their, their um, performance on that day. Mm -hmm. We'll also have music and food and a motivational speaker. We're so trying a, for... So, 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 Donna, a full day of activities full day of on activity the 1st, first. Uh, yes. and, and moving from the 20th, and then also on the... Uh, I'm, I'm jumping a bit because of the interest yes. of time. The then, time then, yes. then on the 17th, yes. um, the, the lecture. Talk to us about the lecture. Yes, from last year we asked Robert Hill to do our lecture mm -hmm. on, on, on Garvey and he gave us a title which I know not much about yet yes. and while I haven't spoken to him we are again in negotiation well we have to discuss yes. whether we are going to have it at Liberty Hall as usual yes. which would mean that we would go to the wreath lane as usual and those persons would then come to Liberty Hall yes. and relax and get ready for this lecture yes um, and as you know we are talking yes. as to whether <laughs> we should actually move this to St. Anne which I think would be yes. wonderful I know that there are conversations the, going on the, 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 you know yes of course being a part of your huge celebration of course, and also yes. airing it live, I think, is really absolutely wonderful. Yes. So I haven't been able to speak to Robert yet, but we are we are talking. All so right. we'll come well, forward we'll, we'll with that. Okay, we'll <laughs> know, we'll know by next Sunday. We'll make yes. that one way or the other. In any case, what we know yes. is that Robert Hill will be in Jamaica and that he yes. will be delivering the Garvey Lecture on right. the seventeenth of, of August. Annual Garvey, right? The annual yes. uh, Morley Moore Marcus Messiah Garvey Lecture. Yes. Donna, it sounds good. It's all coming together, yes. and it sounds as if it's going to be like. A, a brilliant, uh, you know, two months leading up. Uh, we just hope that one of, we can do what we do uh, in unison, uh, together, in unity, all of us, yes. you know, uh, supporting oh, what every, everybody else is doing yes. uh, in, in the different places. So is there any charge anywhere at all for people to come to Liberty Hall to see any of this or you just come no, and be a part no, of no, all no, of this? No, 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 of course. Right. It'll be absolutely free on that day. Okay. On those days. All right. As, as usual. Yes, yes, yes as usual. Right. Usual. Thank you very much, my sister Donna McFarlane, uh, thank you much. director Double. and curator of Liberty Hall. Thanks, Donna. Bye-bye. All right. Thank you very much there. So, uh, lots happening. I hope you have your calendars out and your diaries and so on. You're make, making note of the days. 100 years of Morley Moo Marcus Mazaya Garvey. We're bringing it all together, and I'm quite sure that at the end of the day, it would have come, it would have all come together. We're not worried that it won't. Uh, there is a critical mass, as my brother Jerry says, and we will see to it that it happens. I was saying before, you know, and I was quoting Bobby E. Wright when I was saying that. By the way, let me just say quickly, to Adrian Bailey Hay. We're trying to get to you, Mr. Adrian Bailey Hay, because there's also a very massive event happening at Croydon. 
Croydon in the mountains uh, on August 1, Emancipation Day. That is uh, contested, but this is where Sam Sharp was born. And uh, so we want to, to go there. IRFM will be there. We're rolling out the big bad shark wave and we're heading up to Sam Sharp territory. And we're going to be broadcasting live all day on August 1. Adrian, we're trying to get to you on the phone lines to hear a little bit more about what that will entail. So if you pick up your phone. All right, so we were quoting Bobby E. Wright uh, before uh, on education and culture, where he says that education is a political dynamic and that one of the most tragic beliefs widely shared by blacks throughout the world is that white-controlled educational institutions will educate our children. And uh, this is sad. All institutions, he says, serve to perpetuate the social theory of the group which... Uh, created them. It's important for us to remember that as we focus on developing our own social theory, a social theory determining the destiny of our people, our own destiny. Mualimu, Marcus, Messiah Garvey, Bobby E. Wright, and so many others, Amos Wilson, have laid the foundation for that social theory, establishing guidelines of life, uh, defining our relationship with other living things, defining our values and our rituals. And, and rituals are very, very important. Values are important to a people. Whose values are we buying into? Whose values have we tapped into? And how is that then defining who we have become and who we are becoming. So the social theory is, is very, very important. One of the first places to go, though, is to look at education and to tell ourselves that white-controlled educational institutions will not educate our children. Hey, by the way, can I just quickly say... To Rasman Dito, I have received your book, The Testament of Rastafari. I, I did send you an email to say that I received the book. I haven't had a chance to read it yet, but we will certainly read it. In the meantime, we're reading In the Running African Book Club. What a bit of reading we're doing. Britain's Black Debt by Hilary Beckles. Reparations for Caribbean Slavery and Native Genocide. Chris Alden's China in Africa we're also looking at. Hey, by the way, let me just say quickly also to Cindy Payne that we've also received your book, Ramblings. And uh, <laughs> uh, I'm smiling because there's so many books coming in. And we have to, to... I enjoy reading, so send the books. I really do enjoy reading them. And my brother, Kwame Pianke, in New York. How you doing, my brother? I know you're sending me one, and I'm looking forward uh, to reading that also. To all our friends on the Internet, on Facebook, and on the uh, Twitter, thank you very much uh, for writing in and posting in and tweeting in and so on. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, in South Africa, are you in South Africa? Uh, yeah, but I think you are. All right, so thanks to you if you're listening in in South Africa. Um, tweeting me, my friend in South Africa. <laughs> and her husband, by the way. Good morning to you. Uh, working with the Jamaican High Commission office in South Africa. Good morning, good morning. And to you, you know, we got a tweet from Young Labour Rights. Young Labour Rights say, to what end is the argument about crime against humanity being propagated when the bones of those mentioned are now dust? And I think that came in relation to the lecture given by Tekla McFetch. He talked about crimes against humanity at Pinnacle and crimes against humanity at Coral Gardens. Uh, my young brother and your young labor rights, my young brothers, I challenge you to read as much as you can, young labor rights, brothers and sisters, uh, about what happened at Coral Gardens. And not only to read, but also to find the survivors. They are still living. A lot of the survivors of Coral Gardens are still living, still alive, and their children are alive. And even if they weren't, even if they weren't, 
if a crime is perpetrated against any of us, no matter how long ago, and if it was a crime against humanity, then it's something we have to deal with in this time. So I challenge you, Young Labour Rights and the PNP Youth Organization, I challenge you to be different. I challenge you to think differently about nationality and race. I challenge you to think differently about tribalism and gangsterism. I challenge you to think differently about who you are as an individual and what race means. I challenge you, Young Laborites and PNPYOs, to be different from your elders. Because if you are not different, if you don't, if you do not change, then the hope that we are tapping into, which you represent, the hope for politics in Jamaica as we know it, is dead. But if you do not change, our children will rise up. Our children will make the change. Of that we are sure. Our children will rise up. A race of, a race of people is like an individual man. Until it uses its own talent takes pride in its own history, expresses its own culture, affirms its own selfhood, it can never fulfill itself. Leaving you with the words of Malcolm X. You got to I tell you. At three minutes now going up to... 10 o'clock, we're reminding you that on August 17, the tribute to Moalimu Marcus Messiah Garvey taking place right here in the courtyard of Irie FM. We're starting from downtown Otorias with all the uniformed groups. And we're marching from downtown Otorias, delivering the message of Moalimu Marcus Messiah Garvey with the UNIA children, led by our sister Jackie Roots and the UNIA children. There'll be over 300 to 500 children, young people, on the roads, marching to IRFM on August 17. Uniformed groups marching here with the message of Morley Moo Marcus Messiah Garvey. Our brother Shaka Barak will be here presenting uh, the delivering uh, the Marcus Garvey message and we do hope that there will be others involved in terms of delivering messages. Uh, Morley Moo Marcus Messiah Garvey. On the grounds, uh, we'll have representation of every part of Moalimu Marcus Messiah Garvey and then some. The culture of Jamaica, the drums and all of that on the grounds here at Irie FM. Neatly decorated and neatly uh, covered in the colors of the UNIA. This is what will, will represent, will, will, will represent the, the 100th celebration of Moalimu Marcus Messiah Garvey. So when you come to Irie FM, you'll be hit by that on August 17. Write that date down. On August 1, we'll be up in the hills where some sharp come from. Write that down because we're going emancipation style as we pay tribute to, rememory the ancestors. On August 31, it looks like we'll be at Seville. Let me tell you how that pans out when we hear more about what's happening in Seville. It is going to be a very active emancipation weekend for us, leading to August 17. This is our saying goodbye for today. My name is Kabo. Kabo Ma'at Keru. My broadcast assistant this morning is Joy Morgan. The Big A is up next with Sunday Sunshine. And uh, we will see you uh, next week, inshallah. God's willing. Dear Valente. Uncle Jason.